Good evening, folks. It is Tuesday, July 12th, 2022 at 6 p.m. And we're in the council chambers of the city of Platteville. And with that, I call the regular meeting of the common council to order. Candace, we'll start with roll call. Kathy Kopp. Here. Jason Arts. Here. Lynn Parrott. Here. Todd Casper. Here. Barbara Doss. Here. Ken Killian. Here. Eileen Nichols. Here. Okay, tonight we have a public hearing on a CDBG grant application um, for Mound View Dairy. So this will be resolution 22-17. It's about submitting a CDBG grant app. Uh, Adam. Yeah, so I will kick off this one here. Um, so obviously Ron Brisboy of Grant County Economic Development Corporation approached staff about the potential of submitting a community development block grant program economic development request for proposed expansion of Mound Dairy, a business located within the city of Platteville Industrial Park. Um, CDBGED grant funds are awarded to local governments to assist businesses to create or retain jobs for individuals with low and moderate incomes. Examples of eligible projects include business loans to expand facilities or purchase equipment, uh, specialized employee training, or business infrastructure projects. In order to apply for funding, a pre-application meeting with the Department of Energy, Housing, and Community Resources is required. The business will work with the unit of general local government to complete the application for the CDBGED program. Uh, typical awards are $7,000 to $10,000 per job created or retained. However, the amount of funds awarded per job is at the discretion of the department. At least 51% of the jobs created or retained must be held by low and moderate income persons. Uh, CDBGED applications may be submitted at any time and are reviewed by the department as they are received. Uh, and then CDBGED funds are awarded throughout the year until funds are no longer available. Uh, so Mount View Dairy has indicated that they are looking to double its capacity by purchasing new equipment and create around 20 jobs. Uh, Ron Brisboy has already received approval from the department in regards to an environmental certification letter for the project in which a copy of the letter and report accompanying are within the staff note. Uh, as part of the process of submitting a CDBGED application is the requirement to hold a public hearing in which the following items shall be discussed. Uh, number one, identification of the total potential funds. Number two, eligible CDBG activities. Number three, a presentation of identified community development needs. Uh, number four, identification of any community development needs by the public. Number five, a presentation of activities proposed for the CDBG application, including potential residential displacement. Uh, hear information about the pros expansion of the Mount View Dairy Plant in Platteville Industry Park. And then a citizen input regarding the proposed and other CDBG activities. Ron Bridgeway is in attendance, as well as potentially somewhere from Mount View Dairy to answer questions. Uh, so in regards to kind of a budget or fiscal impact, so the intention of Mount View Dairy at this time is to apply for a CDBGED grant forgiveness loan. Uh, the anticipation is that this will be a limited impact on the overall budget for the city of Platteville and require assistance from department staff and working with Ron Brisboy of Grant County Economic Development Corporation on the fiscal reporting. The grant request is expected to be around $210,000 with the total project cost being over a million dollars, mostly for equipment acquisition. Uh, there is the potential in the event Mountain View Dairy would default on the grant or loan requirements that the city of Platteville would then be asked to support the project financially or repay the Department of Administration. Uh, so within our 2022 city of Platteville goals are the efforts to continually recruit new businesses and increase the number of job potentials for current and future residents. So this grant loan opportunity is a step towards reaching that endeavor. Uh, therefore, staff would recommend authorizing the city manager to work with Ron Brisboy of Grant County Economic Development on the submission of a CDBGED application and would authorize the council to approve the CDBG authorizing submission resolution. Uh, so I will now kind of turn it over to Ron, as I know we kind of have to go through each individual step in order to make sure we are satisfying the requirements. And um, we'll go from there. <laughs> okay, Ron, you can come to the podium, introduce yourself, give your address, that kind of thing. I am Ron Brisboy. I'm the executive director of Grant County Economic Development Corporation. Uh, and thank you for that introduction. And uh, Adam did a very good uh, overview. Usually I don't get that type of, you know, preliminary information. So Adam actually covered quite a bit about this. And the city of Platteville itself has a very strong history in CDBG 
um, projects, you know, we're doing such things as the CDBG close. Um, I'm administering that for the um, the library, or, or excuse me, the museum project, re-roofing the, the museum. But uh, in essence, the this program, the federal government gives awards about 40 or so million dollars a year uh, to the Wisconsin Department of Administration to to disperse these funds out for eligible activities. Obviously, Adam talked about the LMI in this case with um, Mound View Dairy hiring the CDBG. Uh, if they were to receive that, they would receive um, funds leveraged based upon full-time job creation, up to $10,000 per full-time job. Statutory language actually says up to 35,000. The business may try to apply for that, but from my meetings and conversations with DOA, most likely it would be between $7,500 to $10,000 per job. Um, as stated, the position, the um, the funds, uh, the, the, the program allows up to a million dollar um, grant with a dollar for dollar match. And it is a forgivable loan, as Adam indicated. If the company does not create the jobs, the, there will be no loan for forgiveness. And the um, standpoint of um, the low and moderate income, the uh, you do need to hit 51%. We will have to do surveys of the people being hired. Um, and I've talked to, to Mound View Dairy about this uh, in detail and even given them samples of what the, the survey will look like um, to assure um, that this, so they're aware of the, the program requirements. Um, eligible CDBG activities around here, obviously in, in this city, um, you, we commonly look at housing. Obviously I talked about the roofing project, but there's things such as slum and blight removal, our elimination uh, benefits to low and moderate income. Um, housing that falls into those categories, things such as that are eligible, uh, common eligible activities as well as business lending. Um, community needs, uh, obviously I've worked with the community on such matters uh, and this, as a, Joe Carroll and his team have done very well at identifying what needs are in and your comp plans address that as well. And as I said, the city has had a strong um, history of working and developing and utilizing CDBG. Um, just going through some the things on the checklist. Um, the to give specific details on this program right now. Well, first of all, I know one of the activities was will there be displacement of residential? There will be no displacement. Uh, this project will be contained wholly on the Mountain View Dairy property. Um, no, no displacement to residential households or to businesses. So none whatsoever. Um, and uh, so the other things on. Um, that I'm going to go over is just the, the details of the program. They're going looking, as Adam indicated, uh, doubling their expansion of their or the production capacity of the plant. Uh, representative is here from the company um, that I've worked with on this application and this process, and I've been working on this for close to two years now as they would move forward with the, the, the planned um, growth. And uh, mostly, as Adam indicated, equipment. We have done the environmental review. It is uh, categorically exempt or excluded. Uh, so that aspect is totally completed. And I will work with the, the city on this. The biggest challenge within this program usually is tracking of low and moderate income, uh, the employment numbers. We have to track, in this case, there's 21 people, I think, currently employed at the facility. Uh, we have to track the retainage the retention of those um, 21 positions, as well as the creation. I know that uh, we were indicating 21. Uh, some of the initial numbers are also indicated it may be a little bit less than that, but we still have to finalize those numbers as we move forward. And the grant application will be in the range of what Adam had indicated. Um, so that, um, I guess, is really in the um, overview of what, I'm gonna look at uh, one of my other little checklists here. Make sure we're all right. But the, the funds will be used to purchase equipment. And that's how we, um, we were able to breeze through the CDBG uh, environmental review process. And um, I guess that's a developer's agreement will need to be executed between the city and the business to protect the city. I, I, before coming to Grant County Economic Development, I used to operate or run two CDBG programs uh, for the state of Wisconsin. And that was one thing I always made sure was on my checklist is developers agreement between the UGLUG, which is the unit of local government. Uh, it's UGLUG is the acronym we use and the business in this case. And um, I guess um, if there's any questions, that's really an overview of the program. And if the council or if the business has, if you have any questions, as I said, the business representative is here. Why don't we have the business representative come to the podium and introduce himself? Very good. 
Thank you. My name is Jake Neffenegger. I'm uh, so-called the plant manager of uh, Mom View Dairy. Uh, we've been in business for a good four years. Uh, we're just looking to double expansion of the plant. We have a good crew of people that are working there correct, uh, currently. We're 100% staffed today, and a lot of businesses can't say that. Um, as Ron mentioned, uh, <clears throat> in a thing that we could get up to 21 team members, but I'm going to play it safe and just apply for 15. But I know we'll get up to that 2021 range. Um, currently, uh, year to date from uh, last year, we increased production already at 21%. With this expansion, I know the, the first six months will be up to another 15%. And hopefully about another six to eight months after that, we'll be up another 15%. So we have jobs out there for these, these people that are willing to work. I mean, I got a really good crew. Everybody's there every day. They come in with a smile on their face and they leave with a smile on their face. So it's just. What kind of cheese do you make? It's a Hispanic <coughs> style. Okay. Other questions for Mr. Neffeninger? Is that? Good? Yes, correct. Thank you. So, or for Mr. Brisboy. Um, either one of you, I, I heard you say it, so I would probably want to ask you about it, Mr. Brisboy. So uh, one of the stipulations here is that um, the default would happen on the loan. Well, there's a potential in the event that the default or grant loan, if it's defaulted, that it will fall back on the city. Correct. Right. Um, how do you see that happen? Like, what, how is that possible if, and I believe what you're saying is that if you, the company does not create the jobs, then there's a default. If the job, if the, let's say they're projecting, I'll just use 20, 20 jobs. If they, you come within 90% of what you, what is placed in the um, application, you come within 90% of that target, then you'll be considered whole. You've been in full compliance. The, the low and moderate income, if you do not hit the 51%, then you're looking, the business and the city are looking at a full repayment of the dollar amount is how DOA has historically done this. So um, that's where you need a solid developer's agreement, mm -hmm. an agreement between the the city and the business securing those funds that if things default or if, if the business falls farther short than the 90%, then that part, they will not get forgiveness. It becomes a low interest loan to the business. They do not get forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So job creation is not nearly as of focused to me as low and moderate income create job creation, the 51% threshold. And so, um, as I said, the LMI threshold is paramount of importance. The, you know, if they fall short on job creation goals, then it could become a low interest loan. I believe at four, two or 4%, I haven't seen what the state is charging at this time. And then, so what is the plan for retention of these people that you bring in? Like if they're at the retention plan, I'm just really trying to suck up so that we don't in 10 years, be, I don't mind because you <laughs> will make it happen, but. I'm just I'm just trying to see if there's like a retention plan. If it's based on you guys um, creating the jobs and the people, is there any stipulation or any yeah in this um, agreement about retention of these people? Absolutely, there will be uh, retention. We cannot leverage retention. Sometimes the state will allow you to leverage retention, but the okay. company would have had to issue a statement basically to the press that if we don't get these funds, we will close. And I worked on, I administered a similar project to this grant in Lafayette County. I was asked by Delta Three to take it over and administer it because this one does get a little bit complicated, these ED ones when we have to track retention and creation, but we will have to track both. And I have a spreadsheet that I've developed that will do just that. But right now there's 21 employees more or less there. We'll have to submit payrolls um, to document the, you know, the state you know, how many people are currently employed there, how many positions exist, but we have to always be able to show at any given time how many jobs are being retained at those positions still, those positions, because we know we have turnover mm -hmm. in, in industry. Um, but we always have to have those 21 workers positions always there on top of that within two years, we have to create the number that we stated in the application, whether that's 15 or 21 as well. So we have to do due diligence on that to track both of those from now till two years, I believe, well, within two years after the jobs are created. Okay, I'm good. 
Two questions. What's <laughs> low to moderate income? Low and moderate income is 80% of the county's median household income is considered moderate income. Um, I don't have these, the survey in front of me. Um, usually, Roy, last time I checked, I think the county's median household income is around 58 Thousand, it may be up to sixty thousand now. I haven't seen the latest numbers, um, but you take eighty percent of that is considered moderate income. Well, Part-time jobs count also. They can count. Uh, uh, full-time equivalent can count towards this. So two part-times can mean a full-time. I also wanted to add that I had the opportunity to drop milk off in uh, his factory a couple of years ago, and it was one of the most professional, well-run facilities I'd ever seen. Bunch of local ones. So. Yeah. Other questions? Other questions, Other Kathy? Question. Um, can you share with us? I know one of the um, goals for the city is to create paying jobs. Do you have a pay scale of what the new hires? I do. Well, I did. There. The uh, current idea, the plan right now is, this is what the application that's been handed to me um, so far is uh, one production, 14 packaging um, workers. Um, dun, 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 I'm trying to see, oh, uh, production 17 an hour, uh, packaging is 16 um, pre-train. I don't believe these are post-training wages, but that's what I'm getting is 17 and 16 and I will bother Jake on Defining that if he if he wants. Okay. Any other questions, Ken? Uh, my question is, um, what about the location of housing? Is there any requirement as far as how far away you can be located from the plant? No, there is not, Ken. Uh, the the stipulations of you know, are you talking respects to where their employees live? Yes. No, there is no stipulations to that. If we were dealing with state income tax credits, then we would could not count people from Illinois that may be commuting in or Iowa, but not in this this program does not have such requirements. So they could live in Iowa. They could live in. They could. They could under this program. Under this, the stipulations of this program. Correct. We cannot. There is a non-piracy clause set down by the federal government on something like this. We cannot displace if we were going to, in essence compete or look to displace workers in another state, the feds frown on that for, I guess, obvious reasons. But in this particular program, since it's a federal program, it is not, um, there is no requirement or no stipulations to that, Ken. My next question is, um, are there shift changes that people will be expected to follow? In other words, if they're working night shift, they might have to go to in a few weeks, day shift, or do, no, do, can somebody expect that if they're working nights, they stay nights? That, that is true. Uh, right away, uh, once we get up to that 30% range, we're gonna have, we're not gonna have like first shift, second shift. It's gonna be phase the people in and phase the people out. So it's not a so-called two shift deal, but uh, yes, they will maintain their shift that they're gonna be working on unless something comes up, you know, and I'll, we'll ask them, hey, can you work a day shift instead of your night because maybe the workload for that particular reason or whatever. Thank you. Other questions? Other questions? Okay, then I think we're at the point um, that this, this uh, public hearing uh, presentation is different, but I think we're at number seven now, citizen input regarding proposed and other CDBG activities. Is that where we are? Correct. This I would be any opportunity for council members or anyone from the So public. have you, Ron, received any letters or? No, no comments uh, so far, no comments, no emails, no any communication to me about this project yet, but anybody in the audience is welcome to ask questions or make comments as well. Kathy, a real quick question. Um, has the because and, and I'm assuming I know the answer, but just to clarify, has Paydick heard this? I mean, they're aware 
and yes, uh, I met with them. I met with Ela when Ela was still the PADIC director. Ela and I were over there, and I made sure Ela was over in there. Ela was attending, or the PADIC director was attending several meetings, and uh, Adam discussed it at the most recent PADIC meeting. Okay. And this also so it's will been be going on for two. Almost. It's been about two years, okay. but it's also just to kind of update you, Kathy. It is going to the Water and Sewer Commission tomorrow, just to kind of update them, because again, one of the possibilities is you know with increasing production that potentially has an impact on the plant. So we just want to make sure Howard and I have started to have some of those conversations. You know, obviously this is what we want from businesses is to grow and expand. But with that, we also have to make sure we're doing our due diligence on the uh, wastewater side. Okay, so there's no other citizen input. So I think the eighth, eighth uh, bullet point on your agenda is to close the public hearing. So I would be looking for a motion to close the public hearing. So I hear a motion by Kathy. Okay. A second by Ken to close the public hearing. Candace will vote. Cop? Yes. Arts? Yes. Parrot? Yes. Casper? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Nichols. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. And now I would be looking for any motion that a council person might offer in regard to this uh, resolution uh, authorizing submission of a CDBG ED grant from Mount View Dairy. I'll move to approve resolution authorizing submission of a community development block grant application from Mount View Dairy and to direct the city manager to work with the Grand County Economic Development Corporation on the fiscal and program reporting. Second. Okay, I have a motion by Todd, a second by... Uh, Kathy, to, uh, yeah, Kathy and Lynn actually mm -hmm. to approve. So uh, Candace will vote. Cop? Yes. Arts? Yes. Parrot? Yes. Casper? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ron and Mr. Neffninger. Okay. Good Okay. All right, next on our agenda is consideration of the con consent agenda. The following items may be approved on a single motion and vote due to their routine nature or previous discussion. Please indicate to, the count to me if you prefer separate discussion or action. We have the council minutes from uh, June 28th, payment of bills. We have the financial report for June, appointments to boards and commissions. Tonight I have four. Sherry Stewart to the Freudenreich Animal Care Trust Fund, Lisa Haas to the Historic Preservation Commission, Kathleen Connett, did I say that right? Connett to the Museum Board, and Will Lesseur to the Police and Fire Commission. Uh, there are several licenses in your packet, a Class A combination beer and liquor license for the quick trip at 1805 Vision Drive, where Molly Joel will be the agent, a Class Beer license to Southern Wisconsin Huts, LLC, Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, Elliott Student Dick uh, agent for premises at 230 Dubuque Road, that is Pizza Hut. A temporary class B to serve fermented malt beverages to the JCs in Legion Park on Friday, July 29th from four to midnight for the fourth for the postponed fourth of July celebration. One and two year operator licenses to serve and sell, sell alcohol as we're in your packet. Permits the run uh, walk permit for Ben's Hope, which will be held Saturday, September 17th from eight to noon. Uh, the Platteville Community Arboretum Monster Dash scheduled for Saturday, October 8th from nine to noon. We also have firework, the rescheduled fireworks, which are now uh, slated for Friday, July 23rd. I uh, Pardon me, July 29th. I should not try to read through things at once. <laughs> Street closing for Irving Place, North Bonson Street and East Mineral Street on Saturday, August 27th for the third annual Chalk and Cheese Fest by uh, Path and the Round Tree Gallery. And a Main Street from 2nd to Oak Street on Saturday, September 17th from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. 
for the underground annual customer appreciation event. And I have someone here who wants to speak about the uh, underground annual customer appreciation event. We'll get to that. I'm going to read Grant County Highway Construction Age would be uh, 2023. So uh, who is here? Mike? Yes. Okay. I thought it looked like it would probably be Mike. Yeah. All right. The underground. Okay. Okay. Thanks for uh, having me tonight. First of all, if I stumble on my words, I am a little bit anxious and nervous. <laughs> so uh, bear with me. Um, so uh, we've been in business here in Platteville uh, since 2014. I was, uh, we opened actually in December that year, so we don't really count 2014. Um, but we've been in business for quite a while. We've done this event before, but the pandemic put everything on hold, as you know. Um, we'd like, we previously had done it in the back of the building, which we totally can do if, that, if uh, closing the street down isn't an op is not an option. Um, but uh, we want to set up some tents and do some live glass blowing demonstrations. Um, and then we have Brittany is going to do some disc golf disc dyeing. She does custom artwork on the discs. Uh, we're trying to line up some uh, live art demonstrations uh, that could end up being a, a somebody throwing pottery or something like that. Um, we're kind of we don't have any for sure's yet on a few of the additional ones. Um, besides that, uh, you're probably familiar with Tristan Hirsch <coughs> runs Driftmore and does a lot for the community. He's going to be doing the music. Uh, Ron Moraga, if you've ever seen the caricatures that are amazing around town, he's one, he's the gentleman that does the caricatures. So with, uh, he's already confirmed from three to eight o'clock. Um, Firepoy, um, which is uh, the dancing where you've got fire swinging on a ball and it's, it's pretty amazing to see, but um, uh, that is a potential. The one that concerned there obviously was the fire potential fire risk. Um, but uh I mean, we had had it back in the back, but obviously being on Main Street, there's maybe more considerations. Um, and we're open to suggestions on that as well. Uh, vendors were hoping to include Downtown Barbecue, River Bluff CBD out of uh, East Dubuque, and Los Amigos has expressed interest. Uh, we did get okays from everybody involved as far as running the event. Um, the charity donation that we do every event, it just seemed to make sense that we do it to Ben's Hope this year. So we're going to run a raffle, um, and uh, the chair, the profits from the raffle would go to as a donation to Ben's Hope. Um, as I understand, that's a nine o'clock start, and then the run actually starts or registration. Then the event, I believe, starts at ten thirty, or the run does. Um, so that obviously is going to kind of going to conflict with our uh, event. Um, we don't want to do that. We are we can adjust, and like if it was a noon to eight or nine o'clock or something like that. Easy, easy adjustment for us. Um, let's see here, I was going to put a portable toilet. Um, I only really see the need for one because we have two bathrooms in the store, so we can use that. Um, but Potosi portable toilet is who I've contacted in the past. I'm still waiting for a call back from them. Um, and then we have insured the event before, um, so I would be looking to insure it for the day for liability and whatnot um, on the day of the event. Um, beyond that, uh, we're just looking to basically take it to the next level, raise the event a little bit. And we were thinking about, uh, it's been, it was called the pyro picnic because it's a glass blowing event. And so we're working with basically blow torches and making glass, much like the, I have a pendant on right here, little necklace pendant and some other artwork. And we're thinking that if that, if that's a problem, we may just have to do it in the back versus on the street, but we use propane and oxygen. So that's something to consider. Uh, it's a regular barbecue grill tank and uh, like a welding oxygen tank that you'll see them, they're orange, the welders use. And the torches are very similar in BTU that a welder would use. Um, but that is something to consider. Uh, beyond that, I think, uh, you know, we're just thinking we might change the name to Pyro Picnic and Art um, and Art Festival. And that's part of the reason why we were looking for like possibly a potter to do some you know clay work and things like that and expand it and maybe make it more of not just yes an underground promotion event but we also are like well let's make it a more of an art community event um but that's still you know we've still got some development in, in the years to come hopefully we can grow it to a big old bash and everybody wants to come flat also um but i think that's all i had to to bring to your attention and uh, i really hope you'll consider that as an option and do you have any questions that i can address uh, I do have a question. 
has this permit application <coughs> been re reviewed by either the fire department and or the police department? We looked at it on behalf of the PD and pushed it back actually from an 8 a.m. start time to 10. So there wouldn't be the conflict hopefully with Ben's hope. And my understanding is that they're going off a little earlier. Are they? Okay. So I, the, I was rude. Not, not because of this, but I mean, you guys were flexible and we pushed you back to 10 okay. well, originally from the eight, but I mean, that was to avoid the, the conflict. And okay. Yeah. Hopefully I, that addresses it, but I made a note on my paper that, and I heard you say you're have more flexibility online information. And, and so we'll, <laughs> we'll see what we need to do and we'll be in touch. Okay. All right. Excellent. And Ryan fire department has not seen this. So are there, I mean, it's, I don't want to put you on the spot and say, are there concerns that you want to voice because that puts him on the spot too. Yeah. I, and there'd only be minor ones and he just has to follow the codes for tank storage and chaining them and making them secure and tents have to be fire rated and have to have an extinguisher, but I mean, minor, but minor would, code requirements. That so they could. The, the idea would be Mike, that you would be working with Ryan, our fire chief, and with Doug, our police chief, to uh, secure the event, or I guess that's what we call it, secure the event. That shouldn't and be a problem at all. We have a studio on the edge of town, and it's inspected by the fire department. Um, so uh, uh, I'm blanking on the inspector's name right now. Uh, Casey. Casey, yes. Casey's been out there. Um, you know, he gave us some pointers, and we changed them around, and we're running safe out there. So uh, I think we're on the same page and we'll just make sure that we are in this situation as well. Okay. And so you're saying you would modify the start time of your event on this application. It says 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Yeah. Um, uh, basically, we, our store is open from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., hence the, cho the choosing of those hours. Um, but with Ben's hope going on, we really don't, especially such a good cause, like we don't want to be any kind of a, a distraction or anything or, or hindrance to that event. Um, so like, I think our end goal was like, if we could get a good solid eight hours, wherever in that range that it falls, that would be awesome. Um, but, uh, you know, if we're, if, if he's correct and it is, they ha are moving Ben's hope a little bit earlier, perhaps we can, you know, stick with the original hours at 10, but you know, I, I don't know how close now main street works. I've never requested something like this before. So, um, looking for a little guidance, I suppose there as well as far as the times of the event. Um, but yeah, totally flexible. We're pretty easy to work with. Okay, any questions for council members? This is a part of the consent agenda, so it's not general that we <laughs> ask that here, but since Mike is here. I, Kathy? I just wanna make a comment. Um, Mike, I'm familiar with your glass blowing. You were in the park for Chamber Art Fair yep. when you did the glass blowing. Yeah. And it was awesome. And it was very contained and- You wanna get a smile out of me easy, say stuff like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love my art, it's, so, it's pretty no, awesome. It's, it, um, it was very well done. Thank you, thank you. Any I'm, other- I'm sitting here like, wow, like we're gonna put Platteville on the map if we're gonna blow it up. No, I'm just I won't, why um, no, but, we're, we're doing but listen, it so many other ways. Let's add one listen, more. Listen, listen, that's my husband's birthday. If we agree to this, I'm just- <laughs> Oh, I can't do that live. Anyway, <laughs> I like that thought. I really do. So you're going to do something for eight hours on Main Street. Yeah, I think, well, we've had wow. six to 12 glass blowers show up before. I mean, in every event, wow. the first five years we did it, we've had, you know, six on a slow year. And then one year we had 12 and we were cramming them in and you get to meet the artists, see their individual artwork. We encourage them to bring artwork that you can purchase directly from the artist, which is, I mean, that's special. You can buy something special. It's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's something that's different and new. And, uh, I mean, glass art is a big part of our store. So I know we're all mature adults in here out and we'll be mature adults on the 17th, but will the city have to clean up behind you guys? Like they clean up afterwards. You're going to clean up. No, even when now, no, we're going right? to clean it all up. Yep. We are, we've, uh, we, the, the space that we use in the back is all residents of the building. Right. And if there was any bits of glass that could puncture a tire, anything like that, we would never be able to use it again. Right. Um, and aside from that, like you just don't leave a mess. 
Right. Um, I'm that's excited. how I was thought. I really so. am excited. Low key. Yeah. I'm really excited. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Yeah. That's what we want to hear. Yeah. It's going to be exciting and fun. I think you'll like it. Yeah. But yeah, we're we're not we're we're not looking. Uh, you know, we're looking for approval. We're not looking for anybody to do to do the work for us. Um, we will do setup. We will do cleanup. Um, we're typically there. I mean, in years past, when we run till ten o'clock at the store behind the store, we've been there till midnight cleaning up because a couple glass blowers wanted to stay later, and we just do what we have to do. But especially with you know, taking up part of the city and the people that use that street daily, you know, we're going to leave it in the condition we found it or better. Okay. Absolutely. So Doug, I'm thinking that you'll, that, that you'll run detours. I mean, because if it's closed from second to Oak, that's one full block. So anybody coming up the hill is going to have to turn on Oak or, or. Correct. And right we'll left. have barricades up okay. and whatnot. And Same thing. If they're coming down, it'll go up and, second street. And that's a little bit more problematic because you can only funnel them the one oh, way, correct. but it'll, it'll be a adjustment for people for the correct. duration of that event. A review and flexibility is of, uh, of the utmost importance. So. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise this is part of the consent agenda. So do I hear a motion on the consent agenda? Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Jason and a second by Kathy to approve the consent agenda. Uh, Candace will vote. Cop? Yes. Arts? Yes. Parrot? Yes. Casper? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Motion carries. And so, Mike, that means your permit was approved in that group, not as an individual. That just dawned on me. <laughs> Uh, I figured you're, you're sitting, sitting there wondering what the heck are these people doing, but that's what we're doing. Well, you know, this is, this is fairly new to me. I've attended a few meetings in the past just to observe and whatnot. And, uh, you know, it, this, this has been a learning experience and I really appreciate it. And I'm honestly really surprised I didn't stumble over my words more. <laughs> great job. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you all. All right. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be celebrating that birthday. Don't worry about it. Yeah. I think <laughs> Lynn's being looking for a birthday cake. <laughs> Yeah, you might want to have those glass blowers ready, you know, with the candles. Okay, uh, citizens' comments, observations, and petitions, if any. The only green sheet I had was from uh, the underground and Mike. Uh, so, uh, Kathy, would you like to refresh all of our memories about now the 4th of July being the... Yes, officially the 4th of July is no longer the 4th of July. We have okay. moved the fireworks activities to Friday, July 29th. Um, the events will happen at Legion Park starting at six o'clock. Still working on a couple of details, um, but the fireworks, the veterans group will be there with concessions. The JCs obviously will have um, the beer garden and we're hoping for the live music. Um, and family connections will be there with the kids zone. So there'll be a lot of activities. So we just appreciate the community's support. Um, it was a tough decision to have to postpone, but I think it was the right decision given the, how the weather turned out, but uh, Platteville will definitely be the place to be on July 29th. And maybe also on July 31st, is there a special event at the airport? Is there? Yes, there is. The 31st is the uh, Boy Scouts pancake breakfast. Thank you, Parv, from um, switching gears. Yes. So, and we may have some um, uh, exciting, more exciting news to share um, at our next meeting about that to okay. um, some additional activities that we're looking okay. to. But at least now people can mark their calendar for the yes. weekend of the 29th, the 30th, and 31st of July. Plavo will be the place to be that weekend, both for the fireworks and at least for the pancake breakfast. Okay, any other council people with announcements? Okay, let's move on to the next agenda item. These are the reports that were in your packet. Excuse me, oh, oh. Barb. We throw two out there quick. Oops. Two other things. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, don't. I... So one, just want to remind council members and obviously also the public. So um, at our next council meeting on the 26th, we actually are planning <laughs> to have a special work session uh, from 4.30 to 6, which uh, the interim chancellor, uh, Chancellor Vidovich, is going to be here, uh, kind of to introduce us to the council as well as the community. Uh, there'll also be kind of an opportunity to have a little bit of a back and forth to talk about some of the things that are going on at UW Platteville, as well as kind of an update for the community on the entire chancellor process. 
Um, so that just kind of reminder again, that'll be at four 30. I'll make sure you guys get reminders in your calendars, but then I'm going to pitch it over to chief McKinley, um, just because we did get some feedback from kind of some residents about some concerns and just wanted to have him an opportunity to kind of, uh, add on to that. Thank you, Adam. Adam had mentioned that at least a couple council members and I've been contacted, uh, via email by a couple of folks about, uh, concerns about active shooter um mass casualty preparation what uh, kind of uh, contingency planning the, the police department and other first responders do um very difficult topic but it's one that's at the forefront of everybody's minds right now um preparation and planning are difficult because nobody can pick or predict with any accuracy when or where the next scenario or tragedy will occur the best, best strategies harden potential targets but um, you have to do that by balancing safety concerns with our open society that we have um, in platful we've developed plans and procedures for active shooter and mass mass casualty events um, we've developed a rescue task force jointly with the fire department to assist with the care and extrication of the injured. We work with Southwest Health to develop plans for mass casualty incidents. We train our officers for active shooter incidents. Um, that has changed, that philosophy has changed since about 1999 with the Columbine shooting, as opposed to old school, like Todd Casper would know, uh, contain and create a perimeter. Now you go in and address the threat to hopefully end these or bring these situations to a close much, much sooner. Um, we work with the school district and UWP on familiarization with the larger buildings. We're going to have to get up to speed with a number of the remodels over at the university because I went to school over there, but a lot of those buildings are now different. Um, our CRO position, the community resource officer position, has allowed us to place more emphasis on our planning and coordination with the school district, including actor shooter procedures, notification systems, and reunification planning. Um, are we doing enough of the right things? Time will tell. I mean, it's, you, you plan for the, the worst and hope for the best with these things, and hopefully the only time you dust off these plans are when you train for them. But uh, again, do I hold us up as the epitome of perfection in this regard? No. I mean, but are we doing the best that we can and what we feel is appropriate? Time will tell. So thank you. Uh, I, I would go back a few couple, maybe two, I don't know how long ago now, but I have high commendations for our emergency services, the two tornadoes we had almost back to back and some of our flood events. So it does, it does uh, the coordination between your departments and between you and the university and other departments in the county is uh, very much appreciated. Okay, any others? I missed anybody else's hand over there waving. <laughs> okay, uh, now we'll go to the board reports. Uh, boards, commission, and committee minutes. Uh, plan commission, Todd, that would be from July or April 4th. Anything to report? Uh, the plan commission, uh, April 4th, I don't believe I was present at. I think that would probably be true. I think the uh, last plan commission we had prior to yesterday uh, was a discussion. If I recall housing. about uh, housing issues that were brought up and what we could do to um, grow grow that city. So, um, sorry, I don't have any more recollection. It's been a couple of months. Uh, housing Authority Board, Eileen. Yeah. Okay. The water and sewer financial report are in the packet, as is the airport financial report. Uh, report from the task for from the tide uh, group and department progress reports. 
Anybody who wants to make comments on any of those? Adam, no? Nope. Anybody with questions on any of the department progress reports? Okay, then let's move to the action items on our agenda. The first step, which is resolution 22-18, requesting city staff to be permitted to serve and sell fermented malt beverages at designated events. So this is Bob and it's the Bob and Adam show. That's right. You want to <laughs> Who gets it? to go first? Uh, this came before the council last time in discussion. Um, it is a proposal for the resolution to request and city staff be permitted to serve self fermented beverages at designated events. All the recommendation uh, recommended limitations still apply, um, including only to be sold by department employees, only in strict compliance with state and federal law, only in a time frame from 1 to 8 p.m., and only during, a, during the designated event, only in aluminum cans. No carry-in or purchase malt beverages must be consumed in the park, only during designated events approved by the city manager and the parks and rec director. The budget fiscal impact is minimal, and it is a recommendation per the PFRC, the Brasky Committee, and the Licensing Committee city staff recommend the city council adopt the resolution for allowing city departments to sell, serve malt beverages during special events in the city of Platteville. The resolution is attached and it is the same as proposed in the original reading. Any questions of Bob or Adam? Do I hear any proposed action? I move to approve resolution 2218, allowing city departments to sell, serve malt beverages during special designated events within the city of Platteville. Second it. So we have a motion by Eileen, a second by Lynn to approve resolution 22-18. Candace will vote. Cop? Yes. Arts? Yes. Parrot? Yes. Casper? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, the next item on our agenda is to amend motion uh, to amend a motion motion authorizing the award of contract 2-22 for Cedar Street reconstruction and contract 4-22 for the West Main Street culvert. Um, Nicola. Thank you. So at the April 12th, 2022 council meeting, the council awarded uh, those two contracts uh, the, for the Cedar Street reconstruction and West Main Street culvert. Um, and in that awarding, and based on staff's recommendation, the council motions included using opera funds to cover amounts in those contracts that were over budget. And so in the staff note there, you see that the actual motions that were made um, with the first one, including reallocating funding at the discretion of staff um, with options 1A through 1E. And those options were all related to use of opera funds. And then the second motion for um, the West Main Street culvert was with uh, the over budget amount to come from reallocation of opera funds. So those were the two motions that were made when those contracts were awarded. And those over budget amounts that are referenced were largely related to the water and sewer portion of the contracts. Now the city is issuing water sewer revenue bonds to cover uh, the budgeted portion of these projects. And staff recommended at the last council meeting, including um, the overages also in that bond issue, rather than using opera funds for those budget overages. Uh, so that, you know, in the time that passed between April and the last meeting, um, it, it seems like a, a, an option that would give the city more flexibility with the opera funds would be to use the bond uh, issue to cover that 199,676. Um, and so we talked about that a little bit at the last meeting. Uh, we sized the bond to include that 200,000, um, although clearly it's still at the council's discretion whether or not um, this, uh, these motions that are recommended here are acted on by the council um, in favor. 
So um, we did talk to City Attorney Bill Cole about the fact that uh, the previous motions that awarded the contracts had um, indicated that the overages would be covered by opera funds. And he said that the council should approve uh, new motions to amend the motions previously adopted. So what I have here is the recommended language if the council would want to amend those motions. Um, so it would be a motion to amend the motion awarding contract 222 Cedar Street reconstruction to all construction with no alternate bids at the bid price of 1269893 such that the over budget amount is funded through water sewer revenue bond series 2022B. And then the second motion would be similar motion to amend the motion awarding the contract but such that the over budget amount is funded through water sewer revenue bonds series 2022B. And so the financial impact of um, making those motions to amend the motion will be that the water sewer revenue bond um, will include the 199,676, which is already included in that bond issue size of 2,720,000. Um, and also as usual, the bonds will be um, special obligations of the city of Platteville payable only out of revenues of the water and sewer system since these are water sewer revenue bonds. And then it will also preserve the $199,676 of ARPA funds for other purposes. And so um, city recommends that the council amend the motions um, as stated in the staff note. And the, the water sewer revenue bonds don't count against our borrowing limits. That's because they're the revenue language. bonds, not general obligation bonds. That is correct. Yep. There. Okay. Other questions of Nicola on this? Questions? Uh, I think you're looking for two separate motions. Uh, yes, please. Okay. I could go with the first one. I move to amend the motion awarding contract 2 22 Cedar Street reconstruction to rural construction with no alternative bids at the bid price of $1,269,893, such that water sewer over budget amount of $162,344 is funded through the WS Revenue Bond Series 2022B instead of ARPA funds. Do I hear a second to that motion? Second. Okay, we have a motion to amend contract 222, the Cedar Street reconstruction. Uh, Candace will vote. Cop? Yes. Arts? Yes. Parrot? Yes. Casper? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we have a second uh, motion. I move to amend the motion awarding contract 422 West Main Street culvert to Dane County contracting at the bid price of $441,000, such that the water sewer over budget amount of $37,332 is funded through water and sewer revenue bonds series 2022B instead of ARPA. Okay. Here we have a motion by Eileen, a second by Kathy to uh, amend, motion, amend the motion awarding contract 422 for the West Main Street culvert. Uh, we'll vote. Cop? Yes. Arts? Yes. Parrot? Yes. Casper? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, uh, next item uh, for action is short-term financing for the airport hangar project. Nicola. Thank you. Um, and also I see that uh, Commission Chair Dennis Cooley is with us this evening, so he'll um, hopefully be able to answer some questions as well if you have any. So just to review the staff note here, in early 2021, the uh, Airport Commission approved a plan to build a new hangar using state and federal funding in addition to a local match. At that time, it was anticipated the cost of the project would be mostly paid with FAA entitlement allocations which are awarded annually to the airport in the amount of approximately $150,000. And the 10% local match would be paid by the airport fund. Uh, because some of that project would be paid with future entitlement allocations, uh, it was thought at that time that the airport would need to finance the project 
through a three to four year borrow. And this idea was presented to the council back in March of 2021. Uh, the project didn't move forward in 2021 because we were all kind of reeling from COVID at that time and bids received for the project were higher than the commission's target range. And so the commission elected to rebid the project in spring of 2022. Um, and during that time in November 2021, Congress passed the bipartisan infrastructure law. And uh, the result of that has been various, but one of the results is that um, BIL funds are now being allocated to qualifying um, municipal airport projects by the Bureau of Aeronautics in the state of Wisconsin. And the amount of BIL funds allocated to the Platteville Airport has been estimated by the BOA at approximately 159,000 a year for up to five years for qualifying projects. So with the both the postponement of the project to 2022 and with the new BIL funds added to the annual entitlement funds, the airport will now have enough local funds and allocated funds from the BOA to pay for the project by 2024. However, because some of these funds will not be received um, before all of the invoices are received for the project, the airport anticipates needing a short-term financing option to cover those invoices in 2023. So at the June 13th, 2022 Airport Commission meeting, the commission voted to accept the lowest bid of 957,000, which was with Tricon, um, contingent on council approval of a short-term borrow. So at this point, where the, the status of the project is that um, if the council were to act in favor tonight, then the city would draft a letter to the BOA, BOA confirming that um, there, the financing has been approved um, so that the project can move forward. Um, the total project costs, including the engineering, are estimated at 1,180,000. So the schedule that's attached to the staff note illustrates the anticipated timing of the incoming allocation funds and the outgoing invoice payments. And just to identify that uh, the project is managed by the state of Wisconsin. And so those invoices are actually coming from the state to the city once those invoices from the contractor have been processed by the state. Um, so based on the analysis, staff is recommending approval of a short-term borrow by the airport, not, but I guess it would be by the city on behalf of the airport, not to exceed 700,000 to be repaid from entitlement and BIL funds by the end of 2024. So the impact financially on the city would be that the city of Platteville debt will increase by up to 700,000. And um, there is a possibility we have learned from our debt council that it may not have to be general ob obligation debt. There may be an avenue we could pursue which would make it revenue debt because the state funding, the BIL funds and the entitlement funds would be considered qualifying revenue for a revenue borrow. Um, but we, we would wanna look at what's the best instrument that we could use, what would yield the best interest rate and so on. Um, but if it were to be general obligation debt, the city, um, the city debt levels would be at 50% for the statutory borrowing capacity, that's the state limited borrowing, and at 81% 80, of the city's internally imposed limit of 3.5% of equalized value. And the, um, the airport budget will include the interest expense on the borrow and the airport fund will pay that interest. Um, so the recommendation is that, um, that the council approve a short-term borrow by the airport um, with the city's backing not to exceed 700,000 uh, as stated. And then the actual instrument itself would come back to the council for approval um, before the borrow was actually executed. Okay, Dennis, do you wanna come in case somebody has questions and uh, introduce yourself and then if, you may just have to stand there if there are no questions. Uh, Dennis Cooley, uh, live at 1035 Kamala Court here in Platteville and on the uh, been on the airport commission for a while now and, and serve as chair. Okay. okay, questions about this uh, request 
for a short-term borrow of either Nicola or of Dennis. My only question is you will bid this out. You will put, you will somehow announce that there's a short-term borrow of $700,000 and- Yeah, we, we were planning- bid, Or banks or financial institutions can bid on that? Or? Yes, we would, we would want, uh, so this is a little bit different than uh, my normal course of business in terms of city borrowing. So we would, uh, we're working with our bond council um, who is general borrowing council as well. And, and uh, we would look to them for their advice as to what they think would be the most um, uh, financially beneficial way to do this borrow and which would allow the flexibility. One of the things we'd like to target is that if the timing was such, um, like for example, if the, if the project went forward more quickly than expected, Right now, um, the steel aspect of the project is delayed because of supply chain issues. If that suddenly we freed up, you know, and we we needed the funds more quickly um, because the 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 flow changed in the timing, then we'd want that flexibility. In the reverse, if maybe the invoices were delayed but the funding came more quickly, well, we may have to borrow a less. So then we would it would be preferable if we could have a vehicle where we didn't have to borrow you know, 500,000 if we only needed 200,000, for example. So, so we're, we're going to, you know, with the council's permission, we'd like to work with count, uh, the bond council to figure out what's the best vehicle and then bring that vehicle back to the council. And, and if I could, I, I, I would like to walk the council through how we're going to repay this. Would that be all right? Because sure. Nicola gave kind of the worst case scenario. That's if we needed all 700,000. So we discussed the $1.18 million uh, project cost. And by the way, this, this report was created by a UW Platteville student, uh, Oliver Barnes, who's our intern at the, at the airport. He's doing a great job. We have active entitlements right now in our, in our, the, the, dedicated to the, to the uh, airport, which we need to use or we lose them. Okay, so just realize that money is held by the Bureau of Aeronautics. If we have, don't have a project in a five-year period, we start to lose our, our entitlements. So $432,782 is what we have currently available. That means that we, we are short 747,218. The local match, which is the 10% that Nicola talked about is $118,000. We have treasures cash, we, we operate, we're one of only two, possibly a handful of, of general aviation airports in Wisconsin that, cert, that work at a profit each year, excess revenue. So we've got a nice balance built up, but we don't want to tap that entire balance as we go forward. So a local match will come out of our treasurer's cash. So $118,000 there. So net effect that is $629,218 is left. We're expected to get our bipartisan infrastructure um, um, law payment of $159,000, which is not something we were counting on two years ago. We're expected to get that in November. We confirmed that last night with our Bureau of Aeronautics representative, Josh Holbrook, who came to our airport commission meeting last evening. In 2023 in April, we're expected to get another BIL payment of 159, which would bring down what we totally would owe, hopefully at April, hopefully, let's give a best case scenario, of 311,218 to be repaid plus a little bit of interest. And then 2023 entitlements, uh, we would then, um, Contribute those to this as well, 150,000. So there's a good chance that when we go to Christmas in 2023, we'll owe around $161,218. Our final BIL payment was supposed to occur in April of 2024, which is an amount of 159,000, which will leave us an entitlement cost of $2,218. So we'll have 147,000 plus dollars left in our entitlements. But I, we have two concerns. One, well, first of all, this 400 and almost eighty thousand dollars it didn't come out of the sky but but we it came at a perfect time for this project when we rebid it we actually the bids came in lower but everything we've heard from other i was on the phone with wapaka the other day for a couple hours what we're hearing is the project cost is not going down so it i mean this is kind of how it is going forward thankfully we got this excess revenue to use but again it we it isn't ours to keep forever okay Okay, any other questions? Um, Kathy? As um, a member of the airport commission, um, I can attest to how dedicated the commission members are 
all activities at the airport. And um, at some point, I'm anxious to hear a report, a public report from the airport, because every month when we go, it's incredible the amount of flights that are going in and out of there, the interest in the hangars, um, and the commission members themselves are extremely passionate and very, very intelligent about the the whole concept of the like so it's a good team and um i have all the faith in the world that that project is going to happen and it's meant to keep us in this turn toward a business airport uh, we're trying to you know we have hunt camp kruger we have uh, uh tricor people that are, are actively going in and out of that airport now um this hangar is a 70 by 70 hangar it's not a normal one it's a large hangar and our goal is to be able to bring in larger aircraft and to be able to bring them through and, and to house them when they're doing business in Platteville as well. I agree. The airport has made significant strides forward in the last years. It's a, it's kind of a gem that's out there that people just don't even maybe pay attention to. So um, we are looking for a motion tonight. Oh, Ken has a question before we go to a motion. Um, I have a question about um, engineering cost. It says here that they are included. Uh, when you uh, select an engineering firm, do you go statewide as far as advertising? Well, we work through the Bureau of Aeronautics. The Bureau puts out a, a request for proposals and, and it's done that way. We're, we're there, but the, the Bureau is heavily involved in who, who, decide, who gets to be the person doing the work. They actually, they actually bid out the project for, for you. Yeah. So they, they develop the specifications and stuff. So, because it's a lot of, it's a lot of money that's coming in through those allocations. We're very fortunate. I mean, we have Mark Krakowski and you know, yeah, Mark. I know Mark. he's working with our students in the senior design project up here. We want to get this project moving. We want to build a, a new FBO in the next five years. Um, and, and Mark has been working with our students. It, it's a great project coming up here. We had a presentation about a month and a half ago and we are, we've got everything lined up right now. I just get, want to make sure you know that, you know, we're all farmers with the haze down and we need to make it here. We got the wind, it's the windows wide open for us. So for those who don't know what an FBO is, you want to tell us? I well, mean, I do, but. It's our base of operations for the airport, but we're also looking at making it an educational center. We're, we're working with the Fox Valley uh, Tech right now. Uh, we, Thank you, Kathy, for your comment about the, we have 17 people trying to get their pilot's license right now at, at our airport. And we're going to we're going to have hopefully on the 31st, we'll have some uh, a few posters of all the people that went through during COVID. It was a very active airport during COVID. All right, Ken. My next question is, as far as hangar needs, have you taken a survey as far as what hangar needs are for the next five? Ten yeah, we have, uh, well, not the next five or 10 years, but we're full. Um, we, we have uh, uh, put two on a waiting list and two open spots now. And again, the, the new facility we're looking at, um, we've got a, a person now from, uh, a significant person from the Dubuque airport has their, is hanging in their aircraft here now. We think there'll be other people that'll follow that. Um, we were this close to, to getting a chartered flight in and out of, out of Platteville to be able to take your families and go on trips for we're working on that. That's our next move. So as far as the space, we had a gentleman come in from Naples, uh, Florida to our meeting two months ago who wants to bring a very large airplane here and relocate to our area. Um, so we're constantly looking, but we need, it's not when we build it, they will come. We're marketing it actively, but I think when, th this is a different clientele we're looking to serve. These are people that are flying right through our airport now. I don't want to, how far you want to get into this, but Doug Duplessis, is one of our board members developed a, a tracking software. So we literally know the planes that are flying around Platteville and who could stop. So we're going to start to market to who's flying over us and around us. Cause he knows where they're, where they're flying in and out of now. And we want to start to collect them here. And uh, just, uh, just as a side note, uh, EAA will start shortly. I'm not sure it must be this weekend. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. So there may be planes flying in and out that are unusual? Well, the cost of jet fuel this year, and we're usually really, really competitive with that, but the jet fuel price is a little high for, for us to compete this year. Ken. My next question is as far as winter usage, uh, I believe the issue is that you don't have the equipment. 
year. Uh, one of the things we purchased this year was new snow removal equipment. Uh, it's state of the art. It's wonderful. But thank you, Ken. We forget we just uh, purchased a flight simulator, so we're able to give people uh, if the incl weather's inclement on the on the runways that they can get part of their trading uh, at a qualified uh, flight simulator that we'll be also opening to the public here shortly. So. for winter usage? Not that I'm aware of. Um, we've got um, Andy, Andy uh, Lang, our, our airport manager, is very active about cleaning runways. So, I mean, they have any airport person around can get in contact with them. I'm not aware of, of any problems here that were any different than anywhere else. So, have you heard something that I don't know, Ken? I like what I suppose they heard. Well, you're going to hear from me. We don't have a problem. So there you go. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'm seeking a motion. I'll move to approve a short-term borrow by the airport not to exceed $700,000 to be repaid from entitlement and BIL funds by the end of 2024. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve a short-term borrow for the airport. Uh, we'll vote, Candace. Cop. Yes. Arts? Yes. Parrot? Yes. Casper? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Motion carries. See you on July 1st. Thank you. Pancakes will be on me. <laughs> okay. Uh, pancakes on you. Is that what you said? Yes. I have to <laughs> Okay, next item on our agenda is the fire department mobile radio upgrade CIP project bid. Ryan. Got it. So as, as part of the 2022 capital improvement plan, uh, the fire department was budgeted $50,000 towards upgrading our mobile radios, uh, which are the physical ones installed in the apparatus. Uh, the current radios that we are using are end of life by the manufacturer, which means that they will no longer service those uh, radios. And they're also what they call non P25 digital. So that limits us to upgrade our radios to the digital service, like what the police department and EMS service uh, currently are using. Um, so also in 2021, um, I'm sure you're aware, Grant County announced that they were moving forward with upgrading and expanding the county's radio system, which we, we do also use um, to include 11 new and upgraded radio tower sites and installing uh, new radio technology uh, on those sites as well with it. So our current radios are, are not 100% compatible with that new radio system that they're putting in, um, which limits our ability to be fully interoperable with other uh, county agencies. Um, so through the bid process that we created, um, the specifications were to meet both Platteville's radio needs as well as the county's uh, system to ensure that uh, we would be fully ready to uh, support onto either one of those systems. Um, the, like I said earlier, the police department and Southwest Health CMF are already on P25 digital. Uh, so our trucks, when we respond, uh, currently are not able to talk to their ambulances or to um, the, the police department on their digital mode unless they were to switch over to a different channel, knowing that we needed to talk to them. Um, so that limits our uh, ability to speak with them. So we received big bids back from four vendors um, for those uh, mobile radios and the bids would include um, to in, uh, upgrade all of our mobile radios that we currently have. The vendors that submitted were ICOM, um, Raycom, General Communications and Baycom. Uh, we have worked with Raycom uh, who's based out of Dubuque, General Communications out of Madison. Um, and Baycom out of the Green Bay area on various equipment um, in the past. And they have all been satisfactory in the equipment and services that they've provided. Uh, we have never dealt with ICOM, um, which is uh, typically more known as a um, ham radio kind of um, vendor. Uh, they're based out of like California. Uh, so they're not a local unit to us. Uh, so we have never used them and, and are not um, familiar with them, even though they did come in at slightly lower than the others um, for the equipment. So, but due to the requirement that the vendor must be able to provide um, service for our radios that we purchase, 
Uh, as we know, those radios are a, a very critical part of our operations. And if we have a radio go down in a truck, you know, we need to be able to get it fixed in a, in a short matter of time or that vehicle becomes uh, unusable until that is uh, repaired. So we can't have a, a vehicle down for several weeks waiting to get a radio sent to California or whatever and replaced or repaired and, and so forth. So, um, so with that said, um, the CIP budget is for $50,000. The bids range from $39,026 to $82,476.08. Um, uh, there are some additional um, warranty and services options that are available. Um, if we had available funds, um, once we get all the equipment in and, and get it installed, um, which as of right now, um, we're looking at the Raycom bid, which is slightly below that $50,000, but it, 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 if we have that room at the end of the installation, um, we're requesting um, the approval up to the $50,000 so that we could invest that extra money to give us additional warranty coverage um, on those to eliminate any um, costs that could be associated. Um, we're not anticipating, uh, obviously, issues with the radios, but they're electronic and, and anything can happen with them. So um, the, the radios that we bid were for a three-year warranty is included, and um, it is $880 per radio to extend an additional two years um, from the vendor. So there's an, it's about $1,700 some dollars. So there's potential that we could get that extra coverage um, with the funds that are available once we um, see what's remaining after we, they were purchased and installed. So the bid is for just for the equipment itself, does not do in, uh, cover installation. Uh, we are planning to install everything in-house in ourselves. Um, a lot of the structure in the vehicles are already there. So it's, it's minimum requirements and we feel we can handle that task ourselves and save the the cost of, of hiring someone to come in and install them. So uh, we are recommending awarding the bid uh, FDO 1-22 to Raycom um, at a price uh, not to exceed the $50,000. Uh, the fire department recommends awarding the bid as we feel that they are, uh, as they are the lowest bidder that has the equipment that meets our specifications as well as the ability to service and support that equipment that we're looking at. Um, the bid will allow us to replace all 22 mobile radios that we currently have, um, and Raycom also um, does have service contracts to support equipment uh, after that five-year time, which is a potential that we could look at doing that um, as we move forward um, down the road. So Raycom is also the vendor that is currently designing and installing the new county radio system, and they recently did perform um, service on the city's radio um, system, our, our antennas and our repeaters uh, to address some issues that we were having. Um, and um, they also recently installed the repeater upgrade for public works um, to get them from what they call the simplex system to a repeater system, which gave uh, increased range for the uh, snow plows and public works and water and sewer and parks to be able to communicate better throughout the, across the city. So. Okay. Anybody with any questions, comments? A couple questions. Um, Ryan, is there any value to the old radios? There's a little bit. Um, right now, they're about $150 to $200 for a good functional radio. Uh, we feel that they would still be compatible with like the streets departments and water department's system. So we feel it would be better to use them as a backup and replacement for their, at $200, they can't replace a radio for $200 if they have one go on or need a one replaced in a truck. So we feel that they would be a, a better fit to be repurposed within the city. So repurposing the current radios yes. because their value is about $200. Yeah. Do, do I read this right? That 22 radio, that the value of each of the 22 radios is around $2,000? Uh, per radio per radio rough roughly okay. yeah question mm -hmm. how um if this is approved how soon do you get to have those radios that is <laughs> undetermined yet soon? with supply chains soon? we will hope it'll be relatively soon okay um but 
by awarding this, if I call them tomorrow, the bid is valid through like Thursday for the initial bid. So hopefully we can lock in the pricing and get them coming. And then, yeah, we're at the mercy of the manufacturers, but I, I would hope by the end of the year, we'd have it in. Any other questions? And do I hear a motion? To move to approve bid. FD 01-22 Platform Fire Department mobile radio replacement to Raycom at a price not to exceed $50,000. Okay, we have a motion by Todd, a second by Lynn to approve bid FD 01-22. Uh, Candace will vote. Cop? Yes. Arts? Yes. Parrot? Yes. Casper? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, the next uh, action item on our agenda uh, belongs to Nicola again, I believe. It's the proposed 2023 budget timeline. It's the most exciting meeting I've had in about a year. Yeah. So uh, each year we bring forward to the council a proposed budget timeline for the budget process and the CIP process um, so that the the council can review those dates and uh, let us know if any of those dates don't look like they will work. Um, hopefully you had a chance to review this from the last meeting. And um, if, uh, if there's any questions, just let me know. And you would like this uh, acted on as an agenda item so that it's, um, it is our calendar. Yeah, and that has been our practice as a, a city to do so. And it's, it's very interesting to see that budgets are Budgets are not created in a day. No. <laughs> it's a six month it's process. A never ending fun that we love. <laughs> okay. Uh, do I hear questions, comments, or perhaps a motion? I move to approve the proposed budget timeline for the City of Platteville 2023 budget and 2020. Okay. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Eileen, a second by Jason to approve the uh, proposed 2023 budget timeline and uh, CIP budget timeline. Uh, Candace will vote. Cop? Yes. Arts? Yes. Parrot? Yes. Casper? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Motion carries. Well, very good. Now we're going to go ahead and move into the information and discussion items on our agenda. So the first one is the federal award costs allowability policy. Nicola. Again, me. There's, uh, that's quite a mouthful. Um, and normally things related to a taxi bus would involve Howard, and this does involve Howard. But um, the reason it's uh, my item to bring to the council is because it involves the city's financial management policy. So as you can see from the staff note in the spring of 2022 this year, um, the taxi bus transit program underwent a Wisconsin Department of Transportation compliance review, which is done about every five years. And one of the findings in the review results uh, dealt with cost allowability. And the finding is printed there for you. And it states that Wisconsin DOT advises that's Department of Transportation, advises the subrecipient to amend its financial management policy to include the following FTA requirement. Procedures for determining the allowability of costs in accordance with subpart E, cost principles of 2 CFR subsection 200 and the terms and conditions of the federal award. So the compliance reviewer provided us with the language for the policy that would meet the requirement um, to uh, have a cost allowability policy. And so that language is attached. Um, and if the uh, council were to adopt the policy, then it would become part of our overall financial management policy. And so the recommendation from staff is that uh, the council would adopt the federal awards cost allowability policy. And you can see in the policy itself that it's essentially um, making sure that uh, any costs that are allocated to a federal award are appropriate, um, no unallowable costs are being awarded or assigned to those funds. 
um, that the that the cost is reasonable, that it's um, correctly allocable by meeting various criteria. Uh, and the last section there is um, related to fringe benefits, um, and that uh, that those are. Um, listed and provided for in the city of Platteville's employee handbook, which they are. Okay, questions. I just have a question on finding. I was trying to figure out FTA federal what? Transit authority. What is it? Federal transit authority. Transit? Yes. It's a department of uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation. It's a sub, it's sub a subsection. Yeah. So I understand that they have this finding in their review. Did does this mean that we were out of compliance? Does this mean we misallocated? What does I mean? Certainly, language is one thing, but the language finding has to relate to something else. So what, it means is what is the rest of the story? What, what it means is that in this particular area, we were out of compliance with the, with the U.S. and Wisconsin DOT rules for our taxi bus uh, uh, grants that we get every year. So they're saying that in order to come into compliance with those monster CFRs, we need to include this in our policy. I understand we were out of compliance, but did it cost us money? Did no, it? No, not I yet. mean, you know, no. not what, yet. Not yet. We, I mean, yeah. what's the, I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, hey, you need this language because you don't have this language, so you're out of compliance because you don't have language. It's another thing to say, <laughs> you need this language. And by the way, you, you the cost you associated weren't reasonable, they weren't allocable, they weren't or whatever. So it wasn't, it wasn't what we did, it was that we didn't hear language. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and basically what they said, if the, if we do not do this language, this in a timely manner, they could restrict our access to the federal and state grants for our taxi and bus system. They didn't say they would, but they said they could. All right. Any other questions? I really like their finding. It's so. Easy to understand. <laughs> yeah, so easy to understand. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to the next agenda item for information, which is the award of the video camera system RFP. Uh, so within the 2022 City of Platteville operating budget, the Common Council authorized the allocation of $140,000 for the creation of a citywide camera system. Uh, the allocation was approved to be funded by $100,000 of ARPA dollars and a $40,000 carryover from the 2021 Capital Improvement Plan. Uh, during the month of May, city staff worked on the creation of a video camera system RFP, which was open for submissions from vendors during the month of June. Uh, the request for proposal was advertised on the city website within the Platteville Journal and on the League of Wisconsin Municipal RFP website page. Uh, after the deadline date for submissions of Friday, June 21st, 2022, the city of Platteville received submissions from the following firms, uh, Telecom Technologies Incorporated, which is headquarters in Egan, Minnesota, and TC Networks, which is headquartered in Platteville, Wisconsin. Uh, Telecom provided that they are a certified woman-owned business, which has been operating out of Egan, Minnesota since 1992. Uh, they are a Verkata certified provider, which is the cameras that they particularly use, and have been able to deploy some of the most trusted systems out, of, out there for their customers. Uh, they have done work in the city of Oconomowoc and Pwaukee. Uh, TC Networks provided that they have supported technology in Southwest Wisconsin for nearly 24 years. They have built relationships with many local school districts to handle their day-to-day -day technologies. Uh, they currently partner with 22 school districts in a managed service capacity, including the Platteville School District. Uh, TC Networks was sought out by security camera market leaders like 
Hanqua and Axis to provide security camera coverage in additional markets, which include municipalities and manufacturers. And they have done work in the city of Dodgeville and Prairie du Chien. As far as the budget and fiscal impact, uh, TC Networks provided a cost breakdown of the following. For phase one upgrades, uh, the total was $55,930.55. Uh, this would include about $16,000 for software and hardware recorders, uh, $24,000 to be dedicated uh, specifically to the police department upgrades for all of the camera systems that they would need there, and about $12,000 for city hall upgrades and $3,000 for contingency. Uh, TC Networks indicated in their proposal that they will work with city staff on determining the cost breakdown for phase one upgrades that would be made to city intersections, uh, as well as the Broski Center and the inclusive playground. Uh, so they did not officially quote in the RFP as they are recommending starting with the main locations and then reviewing further for cost reductions. Uh, also, the RF NDP indicated that their cameras do come with a five year warranty. Uh, Telecom Technologies Incorporated provided four different camera models with yearly licensing options. Um, so they have a couple of different cameras there that have been listed with outdoor and indoor, as well as different kind of warranty options. So to attempt a cost comparison, TC Networks proposed a total of 28 cameras in their phase one costs. In referencing the pricing structure above by Telecom Technologies, I estimated the cost of cameras as follows, uh, using an outdoor camera as well as an indoor camera, and then including the five-year warranty. So the estimated total came to about $46,532.40. That would be for the cameras and a warranty only. Uh, we would have to do some additional research in regards to whether the vendor had the potential additional costs in regards to software and hardware requirements. Um, that is one of the things when the city staff as well as Platteville ITS looked at it, um, out of the two firms, TC Networks definitely did do a better job in actually kind of bringing us the information that we had requested in the RFP, where we noticed with telecom, it was more of kind of a kind of a pricing sheet that basically you could kind of choose options that wasn't actually directed towards um, specific buildings. Uh, so again, on Tuesday, July 5th, uh, staff met with members of UW Platteville's Information Technology Services to review the proposed submission for both TC Networks and Telecom Technologies, uh, UW Platteville ITS has had experience working with TC Networks, but it did indicate both companies seem very viable. Uh, after reviewing both of the submissions and discussing references of both firms, uh, UW Platteville ITS did agree with city staff to recommend entering into agreement with TC Networks. Um, I have provided attachments within here of each RFP cost breakdown. If a council member would like to see the full RFP submissions, I do have them right here. Otherwise they are in my office. So certainly we can set up a time for you to kind of review those. Uh, but the recommendation from staff would be to award the video camera system RFP to TC Networks and authorize the city manager to enter into an official agreement with TC Networks in the amount not to exceed $140,000. What do you think? Okay, questions. And TC Networks would do the installation. Correct. And that was unclear in the... Uh, other proposal. Yes. Mm. Additional questions. It appears nobody wants to talk about video cameras. That's okay. <laughs> It'll be back up, obviously, for action at the next meeting. So obviously, if any council members do have questions or want to see the proposals, um, reach out to me and let me know. Item C, award city assessor RFP. All right, so within the 2022 City of Platteville City Goals is the desire to conduct a request for proposals for a variety of our contracted services. As you've seen, we've been doing that for a couple of months. Uh, the City of Platteville currently contracts with Accurate Appraisal LLC for the duties of the City Assessor. The Assessor is generally responsible for establishing the fair market value of all taxable property in the city, uh, excluding manufacturing, which is assessed by the state. The assessor is certified by the Department of Revenue and is responsible for the assessment process. The assessor is not involved in the determination of tax rates or the collection of property taxes. Uh, so the RFP was available for distribution on Wednesday, June 1st, 2022, and placements were made on the City of Platteville website, the League of Wisconsin Municipal Minis uh, Municipalities website, and twice within the Platteville Journal. Uh, we also provide information about the RFP to firms within the state who provide assessor services. Uh, the deadline to submit a proposal for consideration was Friday, July 1st, 2022. The City of Platteville did receive one submission for consideration by Accurate Appraisal LLC. Uh, so budget and fiscal impact, Within the submission proposal for Accurate Appraisal LLC are three service options open for consideration by the Common Council. 
Uh, their recommended service option is to do two years of maintenance assessment services in 2023 and 2024, followed by a market reevaluation in 2025. Uh, within the RFP, they provided a definition of what entails maintenance and market reevaluation. I won't read those right now, but they're in there for your review. Um, and what they proposed is the uh, exact thing that was done in the previous RFP contract that we had with Accurate Appraisal. So they did two years of essentially maintenance and then a market reevaluation was this year. Uh, so the cost to provide their recommended service option would be $93,000 or $31,000 per year. Uh, the last contract for assessment services for 2022 to 2022 was two years of maintenance and then a market reevaluation. The total cost of that contract was $68,400 or $22,800 per year. Uh, this would equate to an $8,200 increase in funding needed towards the operation budget each year for 2023 to 2025. Uh, so again, due to only receiving one submission for assessor services, the council does have a couple of test two options. Uh, option one would be to award the RFP to accurate appraisal as their firm did follow the process accordingly and submitted information by the deadline requested by the city of Platinum. Uh, option two would be to decline to award the RFP to accurate and repost the RFP to see if additional firms will submit. Uh, the concern that staff obviously has with this is this potentially could cause accurate to withdraw their proposal and consideration would have to be made then if we're unable to find a firm to do assessor services. Uh, city staff does intend to reach out to other firms to try to receive feedback on why additional firms did not submit a proposal. In my experience in other municipalities, though, I do know that this is a common practice is in the past conducting RFP for assessor services. It is not uncommon to only receive a submission from your current assessor as the amount of work for a new firm to provide services to a new municipality can be extensive. And in a lot of the conferences that Nicole and I both go to, there are pretty much two main firms that are in the state of Wisconsin and literally take the state in half. One is the one that we have and one is another firm. Um, they pretty much, I hate to say it, they corner the market. So you either kind of have an option of one or the other, they usually do not co-mingle. Um, so with all the options and consideration in mind about above, staff would recommend awarding assessor RFP to Accurate Appraisal LLC. Uh, so again, that information is in here. Uh, this is not up for a vote tonight. So we would like obviously council members to take a look at the proposal. If you have any questions, please let myself or Nicola know um, and we'll go from there. But otherwise, any questions? So their contract per year went up significantly. Did their service level go up? I mean, I think one of the things we've talked about is having uh, a person from accurate appraisal on site at various times of the year. So is that included in their proposal? Uh, or is that, and then I know there was yeah. some pushback about not wanting to do that. So they did not specifically put that in their proposal. So in their proposal, they, they are going to a system that is more as was experienced this year, which is much more email and phone call based versus in person. But that is certainly something that if the council were to award this to accurate um, as staff, we could try to make that recommendation actually in the official contract that would have to be signed. So that is certainly something that if as council members, and I believe the feedback we have definitely heard from uh, Claire Klaus is that we would encourage that to occur to have more in person. Um, we certainly as staff would work on having that put into the agreement. They are here for open book and board of review, Correct. but they aren't necessarily here prior. Right. And are all the records that they use, I mean, they, they use records we provide, right? No, they create, the, they create, they create yeah. their own records. Are the records ours? Yes. Yes. So proprietary, I mean, so the contract states that if yes. in fact we went to another firm, we have they, these records belong to us. Absolutely. In the event that, you know, they would retire or for whatever reason, they no longer would provide services, they are required to give that back to the city. Hmm. Okay, folks, that's something to think about for next time. Uh, as Adam said, I think that this almost happened the last time where, yeah, you, you basically, yeah, the state is basically split down the middle. Okay. Uh, next item on our agenda is right there. Uh, award the audiovisual provider RFP. Yes. 
so this is the last RFP we'll be talking about, I think, tonight. Um, but within the 2022 City of Platteville approved budget was the renovation of technology upgrades to the council chambers, uh, second floor conference room, and human resource office. Uh, the City of Platteville has the desire to host and stream, obviously, virtual and in-person council meetings, as well as host and stream in-person virtual trainings and preparations with our citizens and vendors. Uh, the purpose of this request for proposals it was to invite prospective vendors to submit a proposal to supply audio, visual, virtual, and streaming solutions to the City of Platteville. Uh, the RFP was made available for distribution on Wednesday, June 1st, 2022, and was added to the Platteville website, League of Wisconsin Municipalities, and issued twice within the Platteville Journal. Uh, the deadline for submissions was Thursday, June 24th, 2022. Uh, the City of Platteville received submissions from the following firms, uh, Swagget Productions, LLC, out of Dallas, Texas, AVI SPL, out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Advanced Systems Integration, LLC, out of Burnsville, Minnesota, and Integral Building Systems, out of Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, city staff has provided an estimated cost breakdown per the information received in an attachment to the staff note. Uh, in review, the firm submitted the following cost breakdowns. Integral Building Systems had a cost proposal of $57,148.13. Uh, Swagget's proposal was $72,975. AVI SPL was $144,212.44. And Advanced System Integration was $69,186.15. Um, again, $100,000 was approved by the Common Council to be utilized from ARPA funding for the audiovisual upgrades. Uh, so at this time, city staff over the next two weeks will be analyzing further the budgetary figures presented by the firms and scheduling interviews with the finalists as necessary. Um, I will be reaching out to council members interested in viewing the submissions. So if you would like to be a part of that process, please let me know. Um, otherwise, we'll kind of continue moving forward. Uh, city staff will also be looking to meet with UW Platform Information Technology Services in the next two weeks to review the proposals further. Uh, the attention would be for city staff to bring a formal recommendation to the council for award authorization at the July 26th meeting, if you would so choose. Otherwise, potentially an award would be made at the first meeting in August. Um, so obviously, if you would like to see these RFPs, they are quite lengthy, so I definitely can send them to you. I did put them in the package to try to spare you a little bit. Uh, but if you would like to see those, please let me know. Uh, but otherwise, the intention is for staff in the next two weeks here to work with Platteville ITS and kind of reviewing all of the information and then reporting back for you at the next meeting what our recommendation would be. And and you haven't done um, interviews with any of these. The only thing you've done is read paper. The only thing we have done is basically an initial review of the information which has been provided in your packet. So the next steps are basically to kind of start narrowing down um, some of those reviews to kind of bring you an option and then either at the next meeting you can approve that or if you would like additional information or some further information. Uh, we can delay. Okay, anybody questions on the audio visual for the council chambers, human resource office, and second, second floor, floor conference, conference room. room? I have a question. Yeah. In general, uh, yeah, I see the page with three uh, proposals presented. So now what you need to do is interpret to us what all these things mean as far as uh, council seat monitors and video distribution equipment, $8,152. So interpretation what all this means. Right, so that's the next Not piece. Just a little saying on a piece of paper. Exactly, so that's the next piece of the puzzle. Basically, I did an initial review of all four and provided you as close of a comparison as possible. As you indicated, Ken, the next step is for staff to really dig deep into these, sit down with Platteville, our information technology provider and go, okay, walk us through why one firm is, you know, 57,000 and another firm is 144. What, you know, why is there such a, you know, there's some pretty big discrepancies here. So um, we want to make sure. And then some of the firms also too, we're pretty, you know, you can tell, and that'll come further on in the recommendation, but one of the firms you can tell did not even visit the city, whereas three of the other ones actually did. They actually came in, they took pictures, they took evidence. So those are all kind of the pieces of the puzzle you're alluding to is this is the information dump. And now we're gonna go behind the scenes and do the due diligence to come with a recommendation that we feel comfortable moving forward with. Example, the screen over there, is that gonna stay, that thing? Probably not. So there's options. Um, so that was one of the things we discussed with the firm. So, um, some of the proposals in here are that actually every single council member would have a LCD screen that would be in front of you that would be compatible with whatever is presenting. Um, some of it is looking at potential different ways. They could reuse that 
or it could be some different system. That's why I think you're seeing some firms quoted that and some just gave us a very bare bones picture. <laughs> Council is looking this way. Right. And then the people in the audience, they look that way. <laughs> so to me, something needs. Got it. <clears throat> and I think that was uh, our goal here. It's a plan. Barb, one, one comment, um, as a hearing impaired person, um, just encouraged to make sure that everybody that comes into this room or the conference room or the whatever upgrade that we can't just assume that everybody can hear. Yes. So you'll be happy to know in every interview I did, I asked. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Of course, he didn't hear what they said. No, <laughs> correct. Sorry, I just couldn't. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we need to smile. Right. right. Okay. So a lot more coming forth on that for July 26th. All right, the next item on our agenda is sidewalk installation exception, 1601 Progressive Parkway. Uh, Howard and Joe. Yeah. I'll, I'll kick it off and I'll pass it off to Joe here. Um, 2019, the zoning ordinance was changed to require sidewalks or bike paths for new or expanded buildings in commercial areas. There is a procedure where a commercial development may request an exception to the installation. Uh, the procedure is for them to uh, submit a exception form and uh, staff presents it to community safe routes committee for input and to the plan commission for input. And those, those recommendations come to the council for a final decision. Um, and the community safe routes committee uh, back in uh, on June 20th recommends that um, the uh, developer be allowed a, a, a delayed sidewalk installation as part of a development agreement. And then I'll turn it over to Joe for the discussion from the plan commission. So the plan commission discussed this at the meeting last night um, and their recommendation is to deny the exception and it basically require them to install the sidewalk as part of the project construction. So, and what kind of vote was that? Six to one, five to two, I don't remember. Yeah, six to one, I think <laughs> it was. So the majority felt that uh, it should be noted uh, that um, there are two businesses constructing right now. In addition to this business, Arby's is construction constructing. They will put in sidewalk. Oak Park Dental is constructing. They are putting in sidewalk. There's already sidewalk at Sherwin Williams, and there's already sidewalk at um, McDonald's. So, with the installations, over one half the block will be installed. And uh, there's only one lot left to be sold in that section. Anybody with questions on this? I guess I was the dissenting uh, person from last night. My concern. Um, a business, we try to attract businesses, they come in this year, they plan to build, we get hit with an inflationary period that's quite simply not been around since the very early 80s. Um, to give this business some sort of benefit in terms of financial planning, having this business put, I guess, the sidewalk in at a later date gives them an opportunity to uh, utilize the funds they have right now to complete their construction without the additional costs. So we're taking the eight, 10% inflationary issue and reducing it for a few years until they come in with a, a sidewalk. Now I, rec I recognize the fact that it's much cleaner, much easier just to say, put it in right now. Perhaps the businesses have the money as some alluded to last night that they would anyway. Um, but I just wanted to explain the direction of my dissent, I guess. As again, I think 
one of our goals is always to attract business. That's all. Was the was this developer at the on the plan commission meeting too? Via Zoom? Okay. No. Because they were at the community safe roads <laughs> meeting. So I didn't know if they also attended the All right, any other questions on uh, this? Uh, this will come up for action at our next meeting. The only other thing you could chew on as council members is to think about is obviously this property is in TIF number five. So, you know, particularly if you're thinking about requiring sidewalk to be put in and any additional sidewalk that would need to be done by the city, that would be, as far as we can tell right now, we did a, a very kind of high level review today of staff in the original development agreement that was signed with Platteville Development Corporation, it talks about sidewalks. So there is the potential that because that development agreement was signed before the expenditure period, that sidewalk installation could be covered by the TIF. Sure. So that's just something to think about as we're talking about. That would be the sidewalk in the one property that had been developed. Correct. Every developer that's uh, McDonald's, yes, Sherwin Williams, Arby's, and Oak Park, Oak Dental are putting are are right. putting that bill. So you've got yeah. So as a council, you have two options basically. It's said in the agreement that you can special assess. So if you would choose, you could special assess the sidewalk to the current the new, the property owner. The other uh, option of the Pioneer of property. Pioneer property. Yeah. The other option would be to think about as we're starting. As we just did the timeline, we've got CIP coming up and we have the budget. So we as staff could look into further, if directed by the council, about potentially including that additional piece of sidewalk in a, either a CIP or within the budget um, and see if 100% you know, it could be covered by TIF. Right. And then there would only be the one lot. And there'd just I mean, be the one. After we just invested, I can't even imagine how much money it ended costing from Culver's through East Side Road for a, and, and there are people who walk there all the time. So, all right, so that'll be on our next agenda, sidewalk installation exception. Uh, next is deed owned, deed city owned land at 275 Lily Street, 750 Valley Road. And Joe, this is also yours. Correct. Yeah, so the city owns the, the property at 750 Valley Road. It's the, the water utility property. To the west of that property at 275 Lily Street is the Lowinger Brothers construction property. Um, basically where those two properties meet is land where the railroad used to go through the city many years ago. Um, so if you've ever looked at those old railroad property maps, they're not very clear. Uh, there's not a lot of dimensions and meets and bounds descriptions, but um, the situation now is the, the Lounger brothers are shifted to retirement mode, so they're trying to uh, clean up their property and sell it. There's some discrepancy as to the area that they currently occupy. Uh, if you look at our, our GIS, GIS map, the county's GIS map, um, it indicates area where, where that railroad used to go through. It appears that it's identified as city-owned property now. Um, but they have uh, their operations uh, going back 20 plus years ago have encroached into that area. And it's identified in, in the maps in your packet. It's about 0.44 acres. Um, at that time, they tried to work with a railroad to acquire that property over many years and got nowhere. Um, and as I said, the, it, there is indication on public records that it's city property. So basically what they're asking is that the city quit claim deed essentially our ownership rights if we have any into that 0.44 acres to Lounger Brothers uh, to make it part of their property. If the railroad at any point in the future decides they want to challenge that, I guess that's up to them, but that, that's never going to happen. <laughs> um, but it really is land that's not usable by the utility. There's a 30 foot uh, grade change between the, the two flat spots of those properties. So the city really could not access that land from the utility property. It would have to go through one of either the Lounger Brothers property or an adjacent property, which would require an easement. As a standalone property, it's really not feasible to use uh, because of its size, shape, no street frontage, et cetera. So it, it seems to make the most sense to you know do whatever we can to make it a part of the Lounger Brothers property. And then it can become 
taxable property moving forward. So uh, our recommendation would be to quit claim our ownership rights in that property, whatever they may be to Lowinger Brothers. Any okay, questions? Mr. Lowinger, do you want to come to the microphone and introduce yourself? Tom Lowinger, 610 Pioneer Road, Platteville. Um, as Joe says, at one time, this was railroad property. Families had this. This is ongoing probably for 45 years. When railroad pulled out, first thing, you know, slowly removed the rails and there were some ditches. And over the years, a load of rock was dumped here and something was dumped there and a little bit level out over there. And 20 years later, you got a level spot and then you start pouring a little cement, park the trucks on, and over 45 years, you have a flat area to use for trucks and forms and storage. And that's how it evolved, making use of the land that was basically abandoned. And so then evidently it just falls into no man's land. And so I guess we're asking you for a quick claim name. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? There is, a, for those of you who weren't at the plan commission last night, there is no access to this property off Valley Road, which is the road below. Uh, basically the access is through the land, <laughs> through the Lowinger land, so. It's a very steep embankment. Yeah. And then there's also power lines overhead that have an easement basically over the embankment. So there you go. Okay, well, thank you for coming. And uh, this will be on our uh, agenda for action at our next meeting. Next month. Thank yep. Oh, next, no, next meeting, July 26th. All right. Two weeks. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the next item on our agenda is a planned unit development for 305 East Side Road. Joe. Uh, yeah, so uh, Family Advocates is looking to uh, construct a new facility uh, in the city of Platteville. They've identified the property at 305 East Side Road as a, a, their preferred location. Um, that raised an issue um, from a zoning standpoint because the facility they'd like to build, it's a 13,000 square foot plus building. That would be basically their offices, but it would also contain the, a shelter within there. So from an office standpoint, you know, that's a commercial type of use under our zoning. The shelter would be more like a residential use. So we don't have a lot of uh, options within our zoning ordinance that allows commercial and residential. The downtown area, the B3, does allow that combination if the residential is on the second floor, uh, which does not allow uh, very good use for handicapped accessibility, which is something they, they would like to provide. So they'd like to have that building all on one floor. So uh, to accommodate that, we're looking at this development uh, proposal as a planned unit development, which gives us a lot more flexibility in, in providing that mixture of uses, but it also gives us the ability to look into more details of the project. If there's other areas of concern, we can address those as part of that process. So as I mentioned, it would be a 13,000 plus a square foot building, uh, office and shelter facility. They'd have a, a fenced in uh, outdoor area for the tenants. There'd be parking up front for the office space, parking in the rear for the tenants. Um, um, I think that about covers it, but uh, as a plan unit development, like I said, it does give us the ability to look into a, a lot of details, but right now would be the, the general development plan where you're basically approving the, the concept, the use and, and the details that are provided uh, as part of the second round, the SIP, we can get into more specifics of the project if we'd like to, as far as building materials, colors, landscaping, whatever you'd like to address, we can talk about as part of that. But um, staff does feel that it's a, a good proposal for that location. And uh, the plan commission did uh, review this also last night and also recommended approval. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, can you verify is this property within TID 6? Correct. Yes. And so, how does this property, which will become not for profit and not pay tax, affect TID 6? 
Take that one. <laughs> Good question. Um, so as it stands right now, that property is not owned by the city. So that actually is owned by another property owner. So right now it is on the tax roll. Um, currently it is either, depending on how they have that set up, I'd have to dig into it. It's probably zone, it's probably agricultural right now. Um, so I don't know, you know, what their taxes are on it is probably limited because there's nothing on the site. So, um, from that standpoint, it's not generating, you know, robust revenue as it currently stands. But the question comes to if it was a company that obviously is a profit organization, that's a completely different matter. Um, the issue obviously we have with TIF number six is that is one of our financially concerned TIF districts. Um, so as you all know, as we've talked about, I think when Nicola did the report, she did a great job kind of explaining that there has been a six year extension done on that TIF district. The main reason that was done was twofold. One is because of the technical college um, exception that was granted. So in about 2000, between 2011 and 2013, uh, the uh, state legislature actually made some changes in regards to the tax rate for uh, technical colleges. And so what that did is a lot of TIFs, including ours, um, caused any financial scenario that you were using to estimate the amount of taxes that potentially were coming from technical colleges was now reduced. So that potentially caused some TIF districts to now go into distress because the money that the taxes that you were supposed to be getting was no longer there. Um, so what they allowed is for municipalities to request a three-year extension in those TIFs because of that to try to recoup some of that lost tax revenue. Uh, then you also have a three-year extension that you can apply for uh, if you do feel that there's an issue with your TIF district that potentially could cause more tax dollars to have to be raised by residents to cover any you know, problems you're having with deals or you know, essentially being able to fund the TIF. Uh, so what happened uh, with the last year was the TIF was extended for six years. So currently, as it currently stands right now, if nothing were to happen in our TIF district until we closed in 2032, it is projected to close in 2032 with a positive cash balance. So essentially it would recoup all of those expenditures. Um, the difference here in this particular scenario is that by having it become a nonprofit entity, you are not recouping taxes. Uh, so there is no additional revenue that you are receiving versus if it were a company that were coming in that were putting something in there, um, you know, potentially that is tax value that would be added to the TIF district. And what that would mean is potentially then instead of closing in 2032, you possibly would be able to close earlier because you're recouping, you know, additional. Now, there are some projects that are occurring in TIF 6 that are helping. Obviously, Quick Trip is a good example. Um, that was one that is going to add some value to the TIF. So we are anticipating to see that. Uh, there always is the potential that something could go in there. So what that means for the council is you have a couple of options, obviously, to consider with any plan unit development is you can put conditions on there. Um, one of them would be for the city to enter into it, a development agreement with family advocates in regards to what would be a payment in lieu of taxes. Um, what was brought forward, obviously, at the plan commission meeting, family advocates is obviously here, so I'm sure they'll echo this, but with being a nonprofit, there obviously is a concern about being able to raise additional funding uh, for a payment in lieu of taxes. But as a council, you have a couple of scenarios you can consider. One is obviously you cannot require them to have anything. Uh, what that would mean is essentially you're giving this particular property over. Um, you could look at potentially some type of a payment that would only be required through the life of the TIF. And then when the TIF closes, uh, potentially then they would no longer be required to make that payment or potentially you could require as we have done with other sources that the payment in lieu of taxes stands. Um, those are obviously all things that we can kind of consider, uh, but obviously those would have to be discussions that we would want to have with family advocates because at the same point in time, the service they're providing, uh, we want to be very cautious that we are not hindering their operation because they are providing a service to the community. Um, you know, some of the concerns that came up in the meeting is obviously there are not a lot of three acre parcels that particularly they're looking for that are available. Um, they would be looking to take their current facility that is located on Court Street and possibly putting that back onto the tax roll. Um, so that is something to consider. Uh, but obviously, there's a lot of uh, you know conversations and things that you need to think about as a council because they do have financial implications. Um, you know, we do feel that the TIF district will be able to recover, uh, but we also want to make sure that we're doing everything possible to try to make that TIF district as financially feasible and successful as possible. So, a lot of things to consider with this. <laughs> What happens if the TIF district goes in the red? Essentially, if the TIF district goes in the red, at, by the time it would close, which would be 2032, 
that then has to be covered by the city. Um, so what happens now is essentially all of the taxing jurisdictions says the city, the technical college, the uh, school district, as well as Grant County are all pooling their money into that TIF district. So instead of, you know, as anybody who's not in a TIF district, your property taxes go to all of those entities, all that tax money is currently going into the TIF. In the event that they and, go into- And the, it's being, it's going into the TIF, what, what's it doing in the TIF? Essentially it's, it's being utilized. Being no, it's being utilized for multiple things. So it's either being, it's going towards um, you know, in developer incentives that were given. It's going to pay off debt that was used to construct roads, to construct projects, et cetera, advertising. Um, it's going to a lot of our economic development partners. You know, it's, it's, it's in a lot of places. What would happen essentially if we go into the red is that then the city then has to cover that deficit until the TIF closes. And then if the TIF closes and we're still at a deficit, it basically falls onto the city, not the other taxing jurisdictions to pay that difference. Um, so then we would essentially have to take out some type of loan to basically cover what we didn't, you know, what was in the red. And just just for clarification, Howard did pull up the, the property information that tax taxes paid on that property right now is $18.76. So it's clearly ag use. So it's not the revenue that we'd lose, you know, from where we're now. It's, we were... it's the potential if, right. if there was a taxable development on that property instead of a non-taxable. And just to just to clarify what Adam was explaining too, so um, as the years go along for TID six, there will be a period of time where uh, the TID needs temporary funding, if you will, to cover uh, annual deficits. But currently, it's projected to close in the black. So, so it's temporary funding, and and again, this is something that we'll be bringing to the council in the future uh, for a recommended borrow that can happen in the TID um, that- But it would be borrowing. It would be borrowing so that yeah. uh, the city did not have to advance funds from the general fund to cover those deficits on a temporary basis. Ultimately then the, the TID is projected to have enough revenue to pay off that debt and all of its other obligations um, before it closes and therefore close in the black, which would mean that the city would not have any permanent um, uh, deficit to cover. It, it, it was, it's just that we have to find a way to cover it temporarily. There was a time a few years ago when it was projected to, to, to close in the red and then the city would be responsible for covering that deficit, that final deficit. But now with, uh, uh, with some development that's taken place there and with increases in, in um, values of the properties there, uh, it's now looking much better. That's a better picture. Okay, and so when you say we would have to borrow for the debt, it would be, I'm going to use the analogy of the airport. It would be like the airport commission borrowing, but in this case, the TID would borrow. And then the revenue that was generated through increment in the TID would pay off that debt rather than it being general obligation debt or added to the tax. That's, ex that's exactly right. Um, so the, the, the debt that currently exists in the TID will be paid off in 2028. So that's the current debt in the, in the TID. And, and it, those payments are pretty hefty going from now through 2028. But the, um, the two extensions that Adam talked about take the life of the TID out to 2032. So those last four years, there will be projected to be a lot of increment coming in with no debt payment and really not much in the way of cost uh, for those final four years. And that will allow the TID to, um, to repay the city or the temporary borrow that we were just talking about. So you're right, it's, it's just like the, the commission borrow, it will be repaid with these funds that are gonna come in in later years. Okay, other questions? Yeah, I guess I had some comments. There was a couple of dissenting votes last week. Yes, there were. And, and Also, so one of the things we've discussed, and first and foremost, um, the domestic abuse shelter and all of its services are some of the most wonderful things we have in the community. I'll never take that away from you. You are, you are passionate people. I give you credit. It doesn't appear to be a very uh, 
easy job if I if I leave it there. However, however, your your service intensive, your service intensive for police, for EMS, for schools, for mental health. Tell me, I guess, why the city of Platteville and its taxpayer should pay for the entire bill related to what is a regional service, regional, even national service. If you start taking a look at the clientele you bring in from all across the country, you know, I'm going to believe that the majority of people in Platteville want to give back to the community, but they don't go to work all day to pay to take care of a regional issue. So my belief is that there should be some sort of pilot payment. They can seek this money out from uh, some of the other regional age areas that uh, utilize their services. Again, they have wonderful services. I would not uh, for a minute utilize them in the past myself. Um, but I think we need to take a look at and say, why is the city of Platteville paying for a regional service? Why it's a taxpayer? Why is it all in the back of the, the local taxpayer? So, uh, Ladies, would you like to come to the podium and tell us about your clientele in terms of where they're from and the regional service you provide? My name is Melissa Pelfrey. I'm Assistant Director at Family Advocates. My address is 121 North Lincoln in Cuba City, Wisconsin. Uh, statistically, I ran numbers over the last five years, and those that are in shelter, 56% of the individuals that stay with us are from Iowa, Lafayette, and Grand County. Um, and then 20% is a reciprocal agreement from the Dubuque shelters and the Riverview Center who doesn't have her. So if they're full, then they'll call us and say, hey, do you have a room that needs help? Um, and then vice versa, we'll call them if we're full. So that's 20%, so that's 76% of the people that stay with us are from this geographic area. The other, um, what, what, what math, 24% um, come from maybe um, one county over, Richland County, you know, Janesville, they could come from Illinois, those referrals from the Riverview Center. Um, but we also do serve people that are looking to flee from Minnesota that have family back here um, or have a friendship back here and um, the abuser and their families um, and, and anything that um, they need to get away from. Um, and we are a domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse and elder abuse um, service to the communities. Um, not only do we provide those services, but to the community at large during COVID, we opened up our food and do 24 hour food boxes to anyone in need. Um, we as well have a 24 hour um, agreement with Southwest CAP so that anybody that's homeless can call us 24 hours when they're not open and we put them up in a room in a hotel. So that's another service we provide to the community at large and not just the victims of abuse. So to um, also address some of Mr. Casper's concerns, we do receive funding from the other communities, the other counties that we serve. Uh, the reason why our shelter has always been in Platteville, number one, uh, people from this area started the agency. It actually started on UWP campus as a call center. And it became a hub here for Platteville because that's where there are more jobs. There's public transportation. There's more, there's, uh, more diversity in our school district compared to other smaller towns. So it stayed here in Platteville because it had all of those opportunities for people. Uh, and again, we do receive funding from the other communities that help to support our shelter. So we get funding from um, different regions throughout the state, different counties that we serve that will provide assistance with our electricity, with our uh, heating and cooling, with which I guess would be the same thing, um, but with food and like all of those things that we get money from them um, to also support the people that are coming from their communities to be here as a safe location. We also additional, have Dan here and I know Dan had some, did you wanna share something? Additional questions from the council of people. Or us first. Uh, 
Eileen? Yeah. I have. Um, when I first read about the application, it seems like a very odd location to me. Okay. And so I guess, help me understand why you want to be located in the middle of an industrial park. And, you know, and I, I read your, your plan with the fenced in yard and all that. Yeah. But I'm thinking, you know, that that's a very busy street. Um, and there are going to be trucks and po possibly factories that are working 24 seven. And I just don't see that as a very um, quiet <laughs> and um, a place that you would put families. And so I, I'm a little confused about why that location, where else did you look and, and why that location? Sure, so I can answer all of those questions. Uh, we did look at other properties. We looked south of the hospital. There's a 12 acre lot there that the owners are willing to split into two six acre lots. So we did look there. Six acres is a lot of land. The three acres is even going to be a little bit bigger than what we need. Uh, we also looked at some property, um, remind me of the other one first, with the hospital, with the hospital itself. And then um, Dr. Rubel had approached us about some land that he has as well. And so we had four different options on, our on the table. And the main reason we chose this one was because we felt it was better in walking distance to ACC for employment, to Walmart for employment, to the fast food places that are out there for employment. Uh, walking distance with the new sidewalks that are being put in to be able to go grocery shopping, to be able to do the things that they need to do. It's also on the bus right near the bus route for our clients. And honestly, there's not really large parcels of land in the residential area that would be conducive. The other reason is we also want it to look like a business. So we want it to be a business so that when people are driving by, they don't look at it and say, oh, that's, that's a shelter. We want people to see us as a business and as a vital part of the community. Just real quick, we did have a, a meeting with Dan Rohrbach um, with a new development that you all are helping um, fund the infrastructure for. And um, they had said because of a daycare being put there that they would have to take it back. They were kind of lukewarm on the idea of us building there right next to the hospital. The other, the proposal that was initially submitted to the Department of Administration did include the land south of the hospital. We had that in our proposal because it was the most expensive piece of land. So we wanted to have a higher amount of grant funding in case that land fell through, we would have something else. But it also requires the water and sewer to be built there or to be uh, put in. And we talked with Howard about that and the cost of that. And again, it's six acres coming off the tax docket and also way more than what we need. And we did discuss all of these options with Joe and Howard and Adam before submitting the grant. We discussed all four uh, of those options with them. Okay, thank you. I have some okay, any, Kathy? Questions. Um, actually, one of my questions is the same as Eileen. Um, when I first looked at it, I thought, but that's the industrial park. <laughs> Um, I also think I, I understand that there's limited parcels that would work, um, but we just approved, um, you know, um, for Mount View Perry to increase their operation, um, and, and Emmy Roth is there. There's, um, a lot going on and Eastside Road is becoming a more major thoroughfare because of the hospital. Um, I do have concerns about the implication to the TID um, and how that may play out. So maybe what, what I would like to see has, has the PADIC board discuss this they have and do they have a did they I'll take that one as the prez place i'm just thinking that that and then it's it's not officially in the industrial park that's correct so dan dressens i'm currently the president of paydeck um no it's not currently in the industry park um this is part of the original cullen farm 
Um, so the industry park actually is located on the south side and the east side of this location right here. Um, it's been zoned R3, B3, now it's M2. Um, uh, hopefully being proposed as a uh, uh, PUD. But um, the discussion at PADAC was that, um, that it, this was not gonna have a bigger, big impact on the businesses and the businesses surrounding it um, had been supportive. Um, Skyway Precision was contacted by one of the board members, um, Aaron Cullen, to talk about that, to make sure that there weren't gonna be any issues with that. Um, they didn't feel like anything, but ultimately from Paydex discussion, um, there was no formal um, action on it, but that nobody really had any issues with this going in this location. Um, the industry park, um, while Mountain View and Emmy Roth are there, but there's a very mixed use in the industry park right now, um, anywhere from construction businesses to office buildings. I mean, the incubator, which has a daycare in it. Um, so I don't think that's really a big concern from Paydex standpoint. Was, was there consideration across the street where, where that um, across the road, where the there's another park? residential property there correct there's two homes right there right now so would that be possible i mean sitting next to homes makes more sense than tucked in um the issue over there is then going to be the infrastructure so across the street uh when you get into the john the farm there was a john's property um we're going to have access issues off of east side drive um currently the access points to that property is going to be basically right at the intersection of Means Drive. Um, I know there's been concerns about the number of driveways off of uh, Eastside Road. Um, this location has been approved by the Plan Commission previously for a driveway access when the certified survey map was approved. I think that was like around 2015, 2016, the access was talked about. So really it comes down to, you know, this is an approved lot with access on it versus the other side has to have access control reviewed as well as water and sewer extended into the property. But then you have the, there's concern about this side of the road. The other side of the road has just as much activity. You have the uh, lumber yard there and the potential for the industry park with the Rosemeyer expansion over there. Yes. Um, it's actually directed to the ladies. So I've never seen this um, draw up of this particular uh, facility and I am on the board before I preface and prefaces. So when I first saw it to me, it looked um, stoic, but then I said, because I know who you guys are, that there has to be a reason for this. So if you can give me a, help me visualize what a person who is running to you in danger help me visualize help us visualize what that place the structure of that place would mean to them because i think if you've never ever had this it would look like a big prison what was your vision in doing this if you don't mind so again we wanted it to make look make it look like a business um we will obviously be disclosed. Our current location is disclosed. We have signage outside of our building. Um, we wanted it to be conducive so that we would make sure that every room was handicap accessible, which is not currently the case at our shelter that we have right now. And we wanted it to just have easy flow traffic. So it, it looks you know, very boxy, right? I think that's what you're trying to say and just that, that institutionalized feel as you're saying. Um, the main thing for us is that, again, it's just having that access, having people feel safe, having people feel that they are a community and that we are there to support them. Um, having living space that's larger and better than what we currently have, having more space to be able to cook meals, having more space to spend time with their children, having an outdoor space that's fenced in that feels safe as well. Um, and again, it was just more for the flow and for, uh, you know, just that the all around good feeling and somebody being around at all times to be there to support them. How will the kids get to school? Is the can we, um, will the buses be rerouted? Like how? That's a great question as well. If the uh, caregiver that's in shelter does not have transportation, that is something that we help them with. Uh, currently our location allows them to be able to walk to the bus stop. However, we do have a large 15 passenger van that we would be able to transport children to school. 
there, even though it looks thick or business like on the outside, is there something that is conducive for the kids to play or like whether it be something in the back, flowers, like what is there anything yeah. that we could say, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, so the fenced in area will have a playground set up for as well. We will have a large classroom right now. We do after school tutoring and we do a Monday night support group for our youth. And so that room right now, um, gosh, it's probably from me to the wall away and from the wall here to here and with. Um, and that's where our children's group is held as well as our after school tutoring program. So now we'll have a large classroom that will be able to offer them more support. It'll also be a play area, arts and crafts. And in one of the living rooms, there is a section for toy area as well. Other questions or comments? I just like to add that um, we, uh, one of our board members, Aaron Cullen, that was mentioned earlier, sent an email to Adam earlier today. And we'd like to invite all of you, uh, if you would be interested to come and take a tour of our current shelter, it can help you to see the need uh, for the larger shelter and uh, kind of open your eyes to what we've been doing for nearly 40 years. <laughs> and, and Darlene, I don't, I haven't heard people say, in fact, Todd right. noted that, I mean, I don't think people have a, have opposition to your shelter or think that you don't need it. I think that the question here is the location. And, you know, I, for those who aren't on the plan commission, I po pointed out last night that the back of this, the Eastern part of this lot on the North side is the fill station for Allegiant oil. That's very close. And while Aaron went to Skyway and said, do you have any problem with our being here? I also know Skyway has plans to expand. So is the question will become, is the noise and additional <coughs> activity conducive to what's here? Uh, Adam, can you remember when Cummins, when that was developed, that big acre site, uh, how many trucks were they talking about? Semi trucks were they talking about taking in and out of their day? Um, they had estimated it could be so they had about 10 total, um, I think a day, and it varied on the time. Yeah. I think it was the conversation. So, you know, depending, there'd be some in the morning, there'd be some at night, and some in the afternoon, just depends. So, so I, I think that part of this council's responsibility is to look it's not just what happens today. It's like, we, we have to think about the growth of the city in five years and in 10 years and how that might impact, what impact that might, in, in addition to the TID. So anybody else with questions? I just wanna reinforce, like you said, Barb, um, I think your, your, your cause, your mission is something everybody can is behind, but the concern is exactly the location. Is it the, I understand it's one that would work, but is there not some, I mean, the, I, I picture this beautiful place with large trees and green space for kids and more of a uh, residential more warmth. Well, there, there, there's currently yeah. a daycare out there currently, and, and and it's mainly because you're using the indoor space. And we utilize or worked with the engineer to make it one level. And so that large of a building, it's hard to place just anywhere. Uh, yes. You, you know, give me a two acre lot right here in town where we're at and we'll build right where we're at. It's just, it's not available. Um, this property sat vacant for 15 years um, in the, in, and it's never been developed. It's been owned by like five different people. Um, but the, some of the rationale that Lynn had um, asked for was that we worked closely with the engineering firm and they came and toured our facility and they identified our needs and they drew up the plan for it and we've modified it six, seven times to a make lot. it work. <laughs> and before this grant was su submitted, we identified the four properties we were looking at. And two of them are in the TIF. One is unavailable to us um, because of, of a daycare going in there. 
And so a, another daycare going in on that same road, they're gonna have that same traffic there. Um, so I guess we, we just don't have anywhere else to go, but the two, the two properties and they're both in the TID. Hey folks, this will be on uh, the agenda next time uh, for action. And uh, we'll move to item H on agenda, the 2022 city goals second quarter report. Yeah, so just kind of closing out the night here. Uh, just wanted to give you a short update. As you can see, <laughs> we continue to be very busy as a city and as a staff and as you guys as a council as well. Um, so just going through again, uh, one of the things obviously we've been working on is with the fire department and the fire station. Uh, so we have received, um, you know, the $7 million in federal assistance through the Omnibus federal legislation. We haven't received the cash yet. We're still waiting for that, but that's all part of the process. Um, but the next step here is uh, obviously as the common council, you authorized uh, the city manager myself to enter into a contractual agreement with Lendl Five Beautiful Design uh, to be the architectural firm uh, tasked with creating the new schematic design for the station. We have started that process. We had a kickoff meeting here about two weeks ago. Um, we're currently in the process of trying to schedule tours that are going to occur in the uh, kind of second or third week here in August. Uh, Chief Simmons and myself are going to start making the rounds now to all of the towns, uh, giving updates again and kind of where everything is at so that we can kind of keep them updated in regards to the financial uh, potential financial implications. So that's everything going on there. Uh, in regards to uh, the goal of having a joint tied common council session, we accomplished that on May 10th. Uh, so that was done where we kind of came up with uh, talking about the community resource guide, which the uh, task force hopes to have finalized here in September. Uh, and then they're also working on looking at a couple additional activities uh, in relation to LGBTQ, uh, race and disability for the community to consider. Uh, Communication Specialist Richards continues to work uh, with direct department directors on the creation of videos and marketing opportunities. Um, she's been working on a lot of the banners that you've been seeing, the electronic banners. That's been something she's been doing an awesome job on. Uh, she's also working on updating some of the banners that are on Main Street that unfortunately have gotten a little old and ragged. So we're working on going to be replacing those. Uh, so you'll see that coming up. Uh, City Manager Intern Swain has been working with Communication Specialist Richards on a budgetary item to include in the 2023 city budget. Uh, for marketing, so kind of thinking about specifically what could happen there. So that'll be done in quarter three and four. Uh, we have partnered uh, with the, our economic development partners on kind of a shared campaign. So that was done in March. Uh, and now we're actually working on carrying that out. So that's some of the slogans and new designs uh, that you'll be seeing coming up here in the next uh, couple of months and in the next year. And then we're also working with them on uh, potentially our October 9th event, which right now is kind of a taste of Platteville where we're working on trying to get some vendors uh, and then also a possible pickleball tournament. Uh, so we're working on that. Uh, City Manager Intern Swain has been working with Director Flesh uh, and also reached out to UW Platteville about the creation of a historical brochure. Uh, so we are looking to bring that here, uh, finalizing that at the end of 2022 and then starting to disseminate that out uh, for resources. Uh, Communications Specialist Richards has created new model slogans uh, for the electronic banners and also utilizing the submissions received from the public. Uh, we're going to be continuing to work on new opportunities and bring forward in quarter three and four the submissions for a Tommy Knocker logo, uh, which has been reviewed by the museum and the Tide committees. Uh, we are continually ongoing to recruit businesses, as you heard tonight, uh, the potential for Mountain View Cheese is one of those to expand. Uh, city staff is in the process of obviously creating multiple RFPs for various service providers. And we hope to have that finalized in quarter two and offer potential bids after all of those. So we'll be continuing that. Uh, we continue to work with private developers on uh, kind of subdivisions, homes, small, smaller lots, and common amenities. And uh, hopefully here in quarter three and four, uh, we'll be able to kind of work on uh, finalizing some of those. Uh, our city manager intern is in the process of finalizing uh, an organizational chart comparison of various municipalities compared to the city of Platteville. Uh, this is in regards to the long-term staffing analysis. Uh, to date, staff has reviewed the museum, fire department, police department, community development, and administration departments. In quarter three, we anticipate reviewing the library, park and recreation, and department of public works. And then our goal is to bring that forward to you before the budget so we can start looking at some of the kind of short-term staffing needs, long-term staffing needs uh, that you can kind of be aware of. Uh, Director Lowe and myself have met with uh, Blackville School District of Abel about the referendum plans for a future community center type space. Uh, we continue to meet with YMCA representatives about potential partnerships there that could be for community center. 
Uh, city staff plans to start conversations with the Park Forestry and Recreation Committee in quarter three about the development of a plan. And we also continue to review the Platteville Armory as a potential uh, community center location and have some conversations there. Um, our museum continues to work on uh, collection documentation and develop a list of needed items. Uh, I am in the process of working with key legislative staff members to schedule a meeting in quarter three or four to talk about broadband services. Actually, the governor just announced a new document that I'll be sending to the council that got announced today. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on there. Uh, we're currently in the process of our 2022 CIP projects, which are Cedar, Gridley, and Hickory Street. Uh, so we hope to have those finalized in quarter three. Uh, we're also working on our CIP water and sewer projects, which will be starting shortly here with uh, UW Platteville upgrades, as well as the Main Street covert, uh, culvert and our wastewater treatment plant upgrades. Uh, we're currently finalizing a lot of our park improvement projects with our field shade canopies, rookie fields, and Legion parking lot that will be starting soon. Um, our museum is currently working on projects in regards to the preservation plan, energy audit, and upgrades. Uh, create city of Platte long-term camera system. Obviously that just came up. So that's something that we'll be talking here in quarter three and trying to start to implement. Uh, Recreation Corridor Bartles has implemented and uploaded a campground site to be uh, reserved on ActiveNet. So now you can go onto online and actively reserve campground sites. Uh, so that is something that has been completed. Uh, work with the inclusive playground organization. So we actually just had a progress meeting today or kind of our kickoff meeting to talk about the schedule. Uh, so that will be starting here either in the last uh, last week of July or August. They will be kickstarting all of that construction. Uh, so we hope to have that finalized by the end of 2022. Uh, and then we are currently planning to work in quarter three, uh, working with the DNR on the creation of a potential urban forestry replacement plan for the city. So there you go. What do you guys do in your spare time? Yeah. <laughs> Breathe. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> No, there's a lot going on, so thank you. Any comments by anybody else? Otherwise, I'd look, be looking for one more motion. Second. So we have a motion by Kathy, a second by Lynn to adjourn. Uh, Candace will vote. Cop? Yes. Arts? Yes. Parrot? Yes. Casper? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Motion carries.